Call the uh, board, of Me board of Education meeting to order at 9.40. <coughs> First, we have approval of the agenda and order of priority. First item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda and order of priority. Are there any additions, items to add or delete from the agenda? I'll just say, Brian, and we talked about we want to spend a little time on the Detroit School yep. and what we can construct to help uh, in that, but do it at our I'll do it in our report. Report. Yeah. All right, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Support. It's been moved and supported. Any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed the same. Motion carries. Do we want to do introductions or do we want to wait when the rest of the board's here or how do you do that? We can do it out now and I can tell them where people will be seated. They've got okay. name tags. Will that work? All right. At this time, Marilyn will introduce the members of the State Board of Education, and then we'll ask audience members to introduce themselves. Marilyn. Thank you. I'm Marilyn Schneider. I'm the State Board Executive. Thank you for brave, braving the weather, and we do expect to have a full table today. People are just on the way and delayed because of the weather. State Superintendent Brian Whiston is on my left. He serves as chairman of the board. And as we go around the table to the left, John Austin is the board's president. He resides in Ann Arbor. Cassandra Albrich, the board's vice president, resides in Rochester Hills. <coughs> Michelle Fecto is the board's secretary, and she comes to us from Detroit. She's on her way. Richard Ziley, board member from Dearborn, also on his way. Michigan Teacher of the Year for this year is Rick Joseph. He's from Birmingham Covington School. And across the table is... Karen McPhee, who's on her way in, um, and she's the governor's education advisor. Eileen Weiser is right there, seated at the table, and she's board member from Ann Arbor. Kathleen Strauss is on her way, board member from Detroit. Lupe Ramos-Montini is a board member from Grand Rapids. She's the board's NASB delegate, National Association of State <coughs> Boards of Education. And next to me is Pam Pugh. She's from Saginaw, and she's the board's treasurer. Thanks. What we'd like to do also is find out who you are. So um, if we may do that, Marty, do you want to start this month? Gladly. I'm uh, Marty Ackley from the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs in the Department <coughs> of Education. And I'm Marla Moss with the Office of School Support Services. Ben Williams, Legislative Liaison, Department of Education. Judy Pritchett, Macomb Intermediate School District. <laughs> Good morning, Dale Wayhill, Associate Vice President for Institutional Advancement at Mott Community College. Kathy Lester, and I'm here from Michigan Association for Media and Education, Maine. I'm Gwen Marchesano, and I'm also from Michigan Association for Media and Education. In the back. All right, we'll come around then. Uh, Jacob Kanzler, reporter with MERS News. Shalon Baxley, Office of Great <coughs> Student, Michigan Department of Education. Good morning, Wendy Barbett from the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs. Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent, Accountability Services. Good morning, Hal Grand, Deputy Superintendent for uh, <coughs> the Department of Education. Do not know where you work. <laughs> we need to talk. All right. Thank you. And Richard Ziley has joined us, and so has Karen McPhee from the governor's office. So, Richard, a board member. All right, so first off, a moment of uh, personal privilege. We have Lupe Ramos Montini. I was featured in a West Michigan <laughs> magazine, uh, and I won't say this right, but Farandola? Farandula. All right, that was close. Very close. It's, uh, it is noted that she's a true leader, champion, volunteer, and activist among the strongest leaders in West Michigan. So congratulations to Lupe. Thank you. Very Thank cool. You. We have another one for Michelle. When she gets here, we'll come back to that. So we're going to move to the Committee of the Whole discussion items. The first item on today's Committee of the Whole agenda. Uh-oh, we can't do that one either. Well, um, the way that we 
we set this up, we were just trading slides back and forth, and uh, I could start. Do we okay. know how late she's going to be? Do we have an idea? They we thought 10 or 15 minutes, so she should hopefully will be here any time. Because it's quarter to now. So I'm, I'm happy to do that, and I All know right. that then, then she can, can add, add comment. anything that she needs to. All right, as you're aware, Lieutenant Governor Brian Kelly convened a special education task force that has been meeting. Members of the task force include State Board of Education members Michelle Fecta and Eileen Weiser, as well as Michigan Department of, S of Education Special Education Director Terry Chapman. And we'll have that presentation from Eileen, and Michelle will join her when she gets here. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to preface my comments by saying that the presentation I'm about to give is actually not on the task force work. That's more or less embargoed. Uh, the um, second or third draft of the report is being edited and suggested on by the, by the members themselves. It's not complete. But this, uh, everything that we did is based very firmly on the results of the listening tour that happened last summer. Uh, Michelle participated in a number of those. Um, uh, I think there were 10, and I think she went to almost all of them. So she'll have a lot to fill in on this. The good news is that as we, um, uh, as we worked on this material, uh, it reinforced a number of the concepts that the board has believed in for many years, including universal design for learning. Um, recently, we had a presentation on multi-tiered systems of support. The kinds of things that we know work educationally were also the things that parents wanted to have happen and that educators themselves realized were working better than, than strategies that uh, are in place in, unfortunately, many schools. So uh, the, um, uh, let's see, there was one more thing I wanted to say. In fact, when I submitted this, the uh, slides to um, Terry Chapman and to Michelle Fechtel, they thought they were on the task force work. So I think that we'll have a really good uh, review here of what the, the issues are that are at stake and how it fits into the top 10 in town in Michigan. Uh, the first slide is uh, uh, the headline that was uh, in the in MLive.com on December 11, 2014. Uh, new special education rules to bring Michigan in line with federal law <coughs> unlikely to take effect this year. Uh, what happened at the time was that the department, uh, uh, in many ways, had done everything that they needed to do and more. They had gone beyond uh, the normal requirements for hearings. Um, they had, they tried to use the internet successfully to recruit uh, a parent comment. Um, they uh, envisioned a way, they tried to figure out how to mesh all of the different uh, regulations in, in something less than the normal jargon, but it was ineffective. So the problems that happened were that the public perceived uh, that we had a very fragmented approach to rules changes, that it was too short a time frame for reasonable public participation, uh, they were angry and hostile, uh, both parents and advocates, over what they saw as muddled, law, muddled laws. And there was confusion over whether state law or federal law would be upheld if in conflict. And overall, it, our efforts to revise the rules were viewed as an effort to undermine what works already in Michigan schools. So uh, this 2014 cry for help showed that parents want more, far more from the schools and, and MDE than we're currently giving. They want all children to learn and thrive, including those needing good special education services. And the current system isn't successful at making that possible through consistently throughout the state. <coughs> Both Michelle and I have personal knowledge of and family experiences working with educators and school administrators on special education. So does Lieutenant Governor Kelly. Um, after talking with MDE, parents, special education advocates, and school personnel, he intervened in the rules change process to stop adoption of MDE's proposed new rules. He then created a 10-stop statewide special education listening tour last summer so parents could voice their concerns and hopes for the future. Michelle participated in a number of them and she watched and heard the frustrations and concerns of parents whose children need better help to succeed in school. I'm going to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to leave this slide for Michelle to talk about because she had such visceral, visceral experiences with parents uh, and I, I wasn't, I don't have those, so I really want you to hear them from her. Um, I, I know that there were very emotional, <coughs> uh, emotional parental reactions, also big concerns about how the education actually worked when their children participated in it, and I know that there was a congruence of, of uh, reactions across the state. 
So she'll come back to that. And as the hearings concluded, Lieutenant Governor Kelly attended the State Board's September 8th meeting and summarized the listening tour results. That is the link to, uh, ooh, it's, uh, it doesn't look all that great. That's, it's not Snyder, it's, uh, but that, that link will get you to his report uh, to the board on September 8th if you wish to watch it. And I want to emphasize that the presentation is, is a summary of the results of <coughs> last summer's public hearings. Uh, and some of the hearing suggestions we'll be reviewing today in this list of slides could not be enacted without legal changes or are not possible for privacy reasons. That's the one area that the task force still is struggling with because uh, we can propose, uh, we can suggest that it's that the implementation of new strategies is more important than current laws, but it's not ours to create the laws just as it's not the state boards. Um, key findings from the summer listening tour and survey. Uh, the first one, develop a more inclusive and transparent rulemaking process was in direct reaction to the, uh, to the, to the <coughs> department's efforts to move forward with required, federally required um, uh, alignment of uh, federal law with state law. Um, the comments were not on the work that was done as much as it was on the transparency and what people saw as their ability to uh, uh, be included in uh, the conversations. <coughs> The second one, improve access to and the scope and quality of special education services uh, was a parental cry. The third one, change the use of restraint and seclusion uh, is something that the board has been grappling with for over a decade. Uh, we uh, put a policy into place in 2006 uh, that um, uh, is only that. It's a policy <coughs> and it's not, um, it, it doesn't govern what happens in the schools. The fourth one, create a better problem-solving process. Uh, and that, uh, with, in the, in the uh, uh, discussions that summer, were referred to as dispute resolution. That's still a common name for it. Uh, the fifth one is to support parents, guardians, and educators more with resources and options. So the first point, developing a more inclusive and transparent rulemaking process. Parents asked for a better system uh, for them to be informed and uh, also to try and engage them before and during the process because they felt as users that we were not uh, paying attention to them. And it's very hard when your child needs services that are different from your neighbor's kids or uh, different from what the, the teacher knows naturally how to do. Um, the worst thing of all though is not being able to have an impact on uh, changing that. Um, you know, having a voice is extremely important. Uh, they also felt that information needed to be shared better and in plain language, including pro any proposed changes and desired outcomes. Uh, for those of you who are on the board at that point, and certainly for staff, one of the difficulties was that um, they were trying to mesh two sets of Michigan rules with federal law. And trying to rewrite that without um, uh, education needs or edubabble. Uh, would have been a major undertaking in its, on its own, but trying to present it to the public then in a way that made sense to people was virtually impossible uh, for the, the vision that the department had had and the things that they had done very well in previous years. In many ways, this is a situation that um, is in response to the ease of clear access, clear information on the internet. Um, uh, par parents and, and all people are used to now, in the last four to six years, just being able to research something and having it pop up in a way that's usable. Um, I'm not a great fan of Wikipedia, but it does work. So uh, what, what we need is some sort of a new approach within the department, maybe translators, you know, because this is an issue of how do you get that language <coughs> into law into, into uh, common speak. Uh, and along with that, using technology to reach the public. Again, um, uh, the uh, movement within um, the, the public community toward easy, easy information. Uh, thanks, Michelle, because I'm struggling. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's lonely here, Michelle. <laughs> uh, uh, but that's, it's a really important asset, and it's not something, that, again, that, that we've, we have a tradition of doing. We're doing it much better, but, uh, but it's necessary because statewide, a lot of these parents are not in a position they have the time to, to come to us. And the last point was expanding the use of existing resources to share and collect feedback. Um, we have parent advisory committees to share information and to collect feedback for MDE, but we haven't really been using that in a way that um, uh, uh, is, is as constructive as needed. So okay. you can either go ahead and we can flip them, or I can take this one and we can jump in on the next one. Okay. 
Oh, okay. All right. Um, why don't you keep going? Okay, so you know where we are, though. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> okay. okay. And this is kind of like what being on the board is like a lot of times. It's riding a cowgirl. How was your right. How was your trip? It was a It was a trip. Okay, it was a trip. Just like a lot of others. So, uh, <coughs> services, access to scope and quality. Parents felt really strongly that <coughs> schools should provide what individual students need rather than just fitting students into their structure. And I thought that in so many ways, this is the heart, the meat, and the bones of the complaints that were going on. Because in the end, for every child who uh, looks like they are um, having struggles with reading, but is a are actually dyslexic, mm -hmm. you know, we don't we don't have the responses for uh, things that aren't diagnosable. We don't have we have a lot of silos right now, and so you're constantly trying to instead of um, looking at what that individual student needs as you do a multi-tier systems of support. Uh, to try and figure out how to give them a little lift and maybe make them a, a, re a regular learner from that point on. We're just trying to figure out how to uh, band-aid the system um, with uh, children's needs and it's not working. So uh, they wanted us to focus services and IEPs on specific student needs and I think that that's a reasonable approach for uh, every child. Uh, we've always talked about having every child have an individual education plan because every child is an individual learner, but differentiated instruction is extremely hard to come by in gen ed or in special ed. They want us to train staff to provide differentiated, differentiated IEP services or to find a way for districts to recognize that that's really important and to make sure that it happens. Uh, some of the examples that they gave were that um, uh, children with Down syndrome need and should receive different services from a child with autism. Uh, they talked about cookie cutter approaches that uh, include segregation and low expectations because teachers can't differentiate between what the individual services are for each child. Um, there, there were two discussions really going on between, it was a matter of the special ed and the task force. There's a, a special ed versus a gen, general ed, education discussion, the training for those two sets of teachers. And I find that these comments from uh, from the public last summer mixed the two of them up. So that's a, you know, I don't know how much training the special education people need, but it may be the general education people. Who need yeah, the, the emphasis seemed to be on um, that general ed teachers needed more um, support and instruction uh, on working with special ed students and that um, there was some debate about, um, you know, about inclusion and versus specialized um, instruction based on the students' needs. Um, but overall, <coughs> there was an emphasis on um, having um, educators be, um, get more support and training for in special ed and to um, not to segregate the two uh, populations. Um, <coughs> they also talked about things like dyslexia identification and teaching, that that's extremely different than helping a child who's behind in reading comprehension skills. It requires a different subset of, of skills and training. A child's needs m must be fully considered when IEPs are being formulated. Uh, uh, IDEA's least restrictive environment may not work for deaf children or hard of hearing unless they have substantial staff support. So placing them in a mainstream classroom if they can't communicate could be totally inappropriate, even if well intended. Um, so Michelle, I'm going to uh, do the next. Yeah, goal. I think it's slide eight. Here we okay. go. <laughs> These were the notes that I don't okay. know if I use them now. Um, so um, <laughs> sorry. Still. Um, so the IP should, uh, as it says, should coordinate or integrate outside clinical treatment uh, and practices, eliminate communication silos. And this was a lot, there was a lot of discussion. There was a lot of folks who came forward with um, kids with autism. So there was a lot of <coughs> ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis, in the schools um, uh, because that would, it's such a terrific uh, intervention. Um, and uh, so there was a lot of focus on that. Uh, for better idea compliance, MDE should provide assistance to local schools uh, on responsibilities and requirements. Um, so, you know, um, and I, I'm sorry, I don't know what you said previously, but there, we also talked about with the roles of what would MDE, and, and Terry Johnson was there, and she was uh, incredible. She was really instrumental in talking about what the department could do as opposed to the board, as opposed to legislature, um, districts, and that kind of thing. So. Um, we looked for the MDE to be able to provide the, um, uh, more information on, on this. Um, 
make CTE programs available to students with IEPs, uh, break down institutional practical barriers. There's been a, a lot of discussion around the CTE actually making it not just accessible but mo um, modified um, in, uh, in, in fine ways to do that. Um, so that uh, kids with uh, disabilities can actually find employment someday. Um, uh, all focus should be on early transition services um, uh, for students in independent, productive, and self-determined uh, adult life um, start by middle school. So the, there was also um, in response in, in the uh, uh, task force and in the tour on the tours, there was a lot of discussion around how clunky, <laughs> for lack of a better term, the transition services are and how di different they are in different parts of the state and different schools. And um, some don't start until the kids are just about ready to leave um, um, you know, <coughs> the school environment. And there really isn't meaningful um, uh, transition to go to and in have an independent life, to be able to work and have, you know, um, and do those kinds of things. So, you know, so we, there was um, a lot of discussion on how to supply more information to parents about their options, give more um, support to schools to help with the transition as well. I just want to point out one thing. The second point up there for better, uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, the first one, IEP should coordinate or integrate outside clinical treatment practices, eliminate communication silos, is actually almost assuredly illegal because even though it's a brilliant idea, uh, IEPs can only concentrate on services that are actually delivered within the school. And we've already had a lot of discussions on privacy, trading uh, medical information to schools that may not be um, uh, able to protect the medical <coughs> information would probably be a breach of, of some law someplace. So the ideas were excellent. Uh, it'd, be, it'd be great if people yeah. could pr um, it, uh, provide some sort of meshing between after school services and in school right. support, but it's going to be difficult to do. Right. Well, a lot of this still has to be vetted, and uh, you know, this is the um, you know, the, the initial recommendations, and what we understand it's supposed to be a discussion piece. But um, but there is some questions, and there were there was a lot of discussion about whether some of the therapies could be provided in school, as speech therapy is, occupational therapy is, all those other types of therapies are. If it's um, is there a way to to make that happen and deal with all the legal issues that you bring up. Mm -hmm. um, restraint and seclusion. Uh, we've worded this. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle and I have worded this slightly differently than uh, the uh, the 2014 or uh, the 2015 summer hearing uh, headline. Um, we, this is a, a, a difficult topic. Um, we took it up in 2006. Our voluntary policy limited seclusion and restraint. Uh, but there's no restriction against it in Michigan schools, and both are still far too common uh, in our schools. Um, uh, the problem seems to be that they're used inappropriately as a control tool or for behavior modification, not as in other states as something that's last resort and well-trained, uh, for which uh, people are well-trained. So uh, the, because of that, um, uh, you know, we've all heard horror stories and seen things in the newspapers that make you shudder because it's especially small children seem to be um, at, at highest risk for teenagers. You know, that maybe middle school years, and I've just missed it. But it's inhumane and barbaric, and it's increasingly dangerous for children and staff because if you believe that that will work and it doesn't, then you keep on going because you keep on trying to get it to work. Uh, it's extremely difficult. Um, uh, both of them should be banned except in specified emergency situations and their use should be monitored for the safety of children and for the ability of staff to teach well. Um, their use can probably be prevented if teachers and staff know how to shape and manage student behavior and if a number of the recommendations uh, were put into effect from mm -hmm. just last summer's hearing, we haven't gotten to the task force uh, report yet, but a number of those strategies would reduce uh, the incidence of seclusion and restraint by their very nature because they open up more <coughs> to better trained uh, general ed teachers and to special ed people who have more resources, more mental, as, as somebody put it once, more tools in their tool belt. Well, and one thing I wanted to say on that, because my husband is a you know a special ed teacher, and when I told him, you know, there was talk about eliminating re restraint and seclusion, he was like can't do that, you know, because there are plenty of times where he's had to break up a fight or he's had to intervene in some sort of an out, you know, uh, where there's 
and it's an emergency situation and it's a safety issue. Um, so, uh, so it's not the elimination of restraint and seclusion. It's, it's the use of it only for emergency situations um, and where there's eminent danger. And um, that's what our board policy actually says. So, um, so it's, and, and it's not saying you can't have a time out. That's not what we mean by seclusion. Um, the, so there's still opportunities to, you know, the kid needs to calm down or have a period to calm down, a brief period. Seclusion is when they're out for significant periods of time and miss, um, you know, to participation in the academics of the classroom uh, on sort of a regular basis. <coughs> I know, and, and, you know, Karen was there for many of this, of much of this too, so if you need to jump in. Yeah. Okay. And one of the specific points that was brought up is that ABA applied behavior analysis uh, can uh, mitigate most behavior issues leading to restraint so that you don't get to that spot. Right, right. So I'm going to give you slide four. Okay. The notes, the notes. All right. And I was on the subcommittee for this too. So there was also a lot but of. But you're not allowed to talk about the task force. This is about the. I mean, we're, we're talking okay. about it, but you have to be yeah. careful because nothing, things are still fluid and it's yes. not resolved. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so one of the priorities that was mentioned by the lieutenant governor was to create a better dispute resolution process. So there had been um, some concerns about, um, and from the parents, about um, complaints were systematically <coughs> um, denied and they weren't, um, and then they, the only way to really get any sort of, um, to get any challenge to a, a district's decision was to um, hire an attorney and go through the due process, which is really, you know, um, as again, as a parent of a special ed uh, uh, student, I mean, I was in that. I've been in that position, and the costs of hiring an attorney are really prohibitive, especially if you have a special ed kid whose half of the stuff isn't covered by your medical insurance. Um, so, the thought of going dealing with the leak, you know, and, and you know, relationship with the schools, and so we're we were, we had um, there's a lot of um, discussion and concern about that. And again, um, Terry was really great, uh, Terry Johnson, and um, sort of um, walking us through a lot of this. So um, again, too many IEP disputes results in lawsuits, waste of time and money, need better options for conflicts when parents don't feel their child is receiving the public education to which they're entitled. Uh, Michigan needs a free ex um, expedient third party review and mediation process, and actually we have a mediation process which no one even knew, uh, very few people on the task force even knew about. Um, so we talked about making that, um, promoting that more. Most cases involve non-compliance with IDA's least restrictive environment, um, addressing uh, the hearing concerns and reduced disputes. So um, we, we, we talked a lot about trying ways to use that mediation process before it ever goes to lawyers. And matter of fact, um, you know, ways to get the people at the table to actually have a discussion and focus on the kids, the needs of the kids and the, 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 the needs of the schools. So, yeah. And I think one of the stats that was brought up was that there's a family in Michigan that spent a half a million dollars right. trying to get a resolution that they felt was appropriate so their child could have a free, appropriate right. education uh, right. for their needs. And then they're like graduated the next year. Right. Because <laughs> it takes forever. Um, the last bullet point on the summer hearings was support parents, guardians, and educators more with resources and options. Uh, families are often overwhelmed and confused when they discover that their child needs special education services. Um, they even feel run over during IEP uh, formulation. They don't understand their rights and they don't understand how the system works. Uh, chillingly, general education teachers said last summer that they felt threatened to stay quiet during IEP meetings to just support the positions or plans of their regional or intermediate school districts. Um, so often, they know the children really well. They may know siblings. Um, they, you know, if they've been in the school for a while, they have a better sense of uh, what can happen for that child than um, than the IEP by itself might uh, uh, dictate or, or regulate and to not have their voices um, uh, inappropriate. Parents should never feel bullied, and educators should be able to speak openly without penalty. Um, the parents were absolutely right on that. Um, the, uh, we needed to, they asked that, last summer they asked that uh, MBE could develop a system to ensure that parents receive the information they need on IEP rights and responsibilities. In the past, that's been the district's responsibility. I think that's federal. I don't think it's a uh, state. Um, 
And teachers need to be protected from repercussions for speaking up for a child's well-being, educational achievement, or individual support needs. Yeah, on the tour we heard from several um, teachers who spoke up who were afraid that they were putting their job at risk just for speaking out about problems around special ed. So clearly there needs to be protections from retaliation for speaking out. So I went ahead and I covered one in your absence, and that was um, oh. uh, uh, the, the, the report one and two, actually. That was what you experienced when you participated in the hearings. I know there were 10, and I wasn't sure how many you went to. I went to, I can't remember now, I think all but two. Um, I didn't go to the first, maybe three. I didn't go to the first few, but then I, I went to the rest. Um, and so the experiences were, um, there was a interest, there was themes that went out across uh, all of all regardless of where you were, but then there were things that were unique to each, seemed to be unique to each constituency. Um, it seemed to me um, clearly that in some of the more affluent communities around Troy and um, that area, as opposed to like Benton Harbor, um, there the the parents um, were that came forward. There were very knowledgeable about their rights and were very, um, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> what I'm not. Um, were very articulate about what what it is they wanted, and um, were real and had access to legal counsel, and were very demanding and very, I mean, and understandably so. Um, whereas. Uh, in, in some of the uh, communities where people may not have had access to that, they didn't even know what their rights were, um, or and they weren't, but they knew that so, it wasn't right. Things weren't quite right for their kid, and they were upset. So uh, I think um, that was something that struck me um, uh, about the differences. But but clearly, it seems um, that there's a need uh, for improved special ed ser services across the state, regardless of whatever the community was. My personal take on it was it has to do with budget, and it's not that administrators are are cruel and don't like special ed um, students or that teachers uh, don't want to be around special ed students. I think it has more to do with the demands that we're putting on the schools and them both financially and um, academically and that creates um, uh, you know certain parameters. You know, so a parent wants all these services, the school budget is only so much. And then what do you do? So that was my personal takeaway um, uh, from that, that, the, that the, the underlying structural problem is how special ed is funded. Um, it's not fully reimbursed by the federal government, never has been, um, but yet there's all these demands on, uh, on schools. And uh, parents want to get the best for their children. So it's, uh, it's highly emotional. <laughs> So, um, Lieutenant Governor Kelly uh, and Governor Snyder created uh, the Special Education Task Force on October 17th, and from that point on, it was pedal to the metal um, because uh, we had a lot of ground to cover and a, a, a lot of different kinds of, um, of uh, voices to be heard. Um, of the people on the task force, here's the breakdown. Oh, you want me to see? You could. Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, it was very diverse, um, and it included uh, folks like uh, Melody Arabu, who's a general ed teacher, but also is a parent of two kids. Um, Ariam Toy. Yeah, yeah, the teacher of the year last year. Um, so she was she was um, she was great. Um, we had special ed teachers, um, uh, Mary. Um, how do you say? Uh, Bowen, and think. who I also think is the um, G R E A. President? Yes, okay. I grew up as education yep. association. So she's uh, she's great. <laughs> Diane, um, you named me. Heinzelman. Okay. Yeah, Heinzelman. I gave you all the. Uh, I gave yeah. you the tough Who was very um, uh, very active. Um, so we also had uh, Scott. Okay, I can do this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can expect. Can expect. Can expect. Um, uh, I just called him Scott, um, and he, yeah, again, he <coughs> is also a parent of a special ed student and an administrator, so he was had a lot of insight. And, and he's interesting because he implemented MTSS five years ago and has seen uh, dramatic oh, right. shifts in how his staff functions and the services they're able to deliver, and he's actually reduced costs from the sounds of it. I mean, right. the cost of, of more intensive <coughs> right, right, right. early intervention. 
Um, so there was Elmer Serrano from uh, Empass, um, Laura Jones and Marcy Lipset, all very active and working on this. Um, and then we also had legislators, uh, Hoon Young Hopgood, um, Frank Liberati, who also is a special ed parent, um, Phil Pavlov, um, Jim Tedder. We also had, um, he came a few times, was um, Marty Nolenberg, who is also was a special ed student with his hearing impairment, so he's sensitive around those issues. Karen McPhee was here, uh, Eileen and I. So um, <coughs> it, was, uh, it, was a, it was an interesting group to work with. I learned a lot. And, um, I'm hopeful. So it's not that we're not allowed to talk about these things. It's just that we were participating in one of the most collegial, yeah. insightful, thoughtful, um, rewarding uh, uh, task forces I've ever participated yeah. in. Th these people weren't going to take no for an answer, and they were all out all the time to protect children. It was a, it was a joy to listen mm -hmm. to them. Yeah. Uh, there were nine task force meetings as a whole, and then Michelle participated in more subgroups than I did on specific topics, but I thought that you were always working all the time. I just <laughs> received nine million emails, and they all were Michelle's name. Yeah. Um, very dedicated, passionate task force members, a consistent focus on improving special education, but it was fascinating to see how the discussions then moved into general education because you have the IEP and then you have the implementation. Um, we had presentations on research-based initiatives in use in here or here in Michigan or in other states. There was a continuous exchange of information and thought through emails. It was, I think that one day I had 40 or 45. It was mm -hmm. uh, just overwhelming at points. Uh, the debates were very th frank. They were thoughtful, probing conversations, and um, I know you participate. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you love being on it as much as I did. Yep. So, yours. Um... Okay, uh, and and I and I want to thank um, publicly Eileen for putting this PowerPoint together um, and doing all this work with uh, us. So thank you. <laughs> um, we, this is just a summary um, because the t I think the the um, the report just went out at the end of last week. Um, so. Uh, so the final draft is still out for yes. comment and revision right. with the task force members. Right. So we don't want to interrupt that process. Um, and we do look, there may be opportunities to continue our work and discussion on these particular areas and delve into them a little bit more as time goes on. So That's we're it. Good. We're almost back on time. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you. John, you have a question? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Can I just say and ask a question? Oh, um, no, we don't do that. Thanks, We're for, thanks, for <laughs> thanks for representing us, and uh, I'm sure the ideas of the group benefit from having your two expertise and the passion. So thank you very much for helping me do this. So I see when the reports come out, is is it likely to be recommendations that are uh, a blend of legislation, um, recommendations to Brian of rulemaking changes? Um, actions for the department? Uh, what would, are the nature of the recommendations likely to be? I, I would say that the group was interested in throwing bombs into the system and to the extent that there would need to be changes, um, they, the, the, cha the kind of changes that need to be made to achieve this really factored into our conversations. <coughs> would it be worth it to try and do this? And in many cases the answer was yes, it's what's called for. Uh, I can't say that the, I, I think that we put more disclaimers as we, in the conversations like this would require legislation or right. this this is not legal right now. That's the sort of uh, timbre of the last draft that I read uh, with great thoroughness. I'm a little behind in my work. Mm -hmm. right now, so. No, I think I think there are, there are things that will, I think will be asked of us to consider or as a board and for Brian to consider. Um, and, and, uh, but clearly, the the, the the will you know there's discussion about making legislative changes, but we can't change the federal law, which is also part of this. So we're dealing with that constraints there as well. Terry Chapman was in a sort of a a, a rodeo roundup with us because every time we would start to consider something, for example, integrating services before and after school, it was Terry who would have to say that's illegal, um, you know, or that 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 isn't allowed by current law or and that probably will never be so those things were um, uh, there were dreams in that task force mm -hmm. and I you know there, there are things that we see should happen um, I don't know how many of them will be concrete uh, coming out as charges if you'll recall um, we got blindsided the department did by the difficulties of parents accessing this rules change it was a welcome breath of fresh air 
only someone outside um, MDE and the State Board, I think, could have held these hearings and have them be, uh, have people be as frank and honest without worrying that it would bounce back on them. And I'm very grateful for the Lieutenant Governor yeah. for stepping forward on this. Yeah. yeah, it was really great working with him, I have to say. Um, yeah, there's, um, there was a lot of, this, uh, pointed out too, that the federal government provides a minimum and a floor. Um, and a lot of the things that we're asking for is to be, to do more than what the federal government is requiring. And also the, <coughs> the uh, special ed laws at the federal level are, are probably going to be um, reauthorized and now that the, uh, you know, ESSA is uh, passed. So th there will be some discussion. Maybe that's something for the NASB person to, when you go to, when there's discussion around what we want for the special ed law, maybe there's things in the, that the task force could um, put forward for, for that discussion. Well, we look forward to the continued work. Thank you very much for serving. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, stay right there. Uh, we have a personal privilege here. We have representatives of the Michigan Association of Media and Education are here to present an award to Michelle. So I would ask Kathy Luster and Gwen Marchisano to come up uh, to make the presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for allowing us the time this morning. I'm Gwen Marchisano. This is Kathy Lester. We are both past presidents of Michigan Association for Media and Education. That's the State School Librarians Association. And we're here today to present Michelle Fecto with MAME's Outstanding Government Official Award. The Outstanding Government Official Award recognizes an individual at the local, state, or national level who has demonstrated a commitment to the advancement of school library services as shown by the advocacy, support, or introduction of legislation or initiatives that promote school library programs. Michelle was nominated by Kathy, and who will share a little more information. Okay, in October 2014, the State Board of Education adopted the resolution in support of school libraries, and the resolution recognize the important role of school libraries and certified school library media specialists in increasing student achievement in our schools. And it called for school administrators to use the SL21 measurement benchmarks um, for Michigan school libraries for 21st century, which were developed by the Library of Michigan's School Library Work Group to assess quality of school library programs in individual buildings. And I want to thank the whole board they unanimously supported this resolution, but Michelle was very instrumental um, in adoption of that statement. She brought the resolution to the school board and garnered support from other members. Um, in my meetings with Michelle, it was really very clear that she has a passion and commitment for quality education for all of our students in the state, and she listened very carefully to all the information I provided and was asked very critical questions about how school libraries can affect students and it was really clear to me that Michelle cares about students cares about providing equitable services to all of the students in our state and we're very proud to prevent, present this award to you today I'm and really um, thank you for supporting school libraries and supporting equitable education for all of our students thank you very much I'd like to get a picture of it, so if you guys could stand and face it. All right, uh, board, in your information folder, you do have information on the Michigan Test for Teacher Certification. It's a three-year cumulative report, and that's there for your information. If you have any questions, let us know. And next uh, item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is a presentation on NASB report on <coughs> career readiness and pipeline to promise. State Board Member Pam Pugh is a member of the career readiness study group convened by the National Association of State Boards of Education and she'll share information on the study group report titled Bolstering the Second C in College and Career Readiness. And then the second part of the presentation will come from Beverly Walker Griffith, president of Mott Community College, and she'll share information on Pipeline to Promise. We thank both of you for being here to present to us.
and I'll try to go quickly so we can get to Dr. Uh, Walker Garcia's presentation. Um, as Brian mentioned, I was um, lucky to be able to be a part of the career readiness work group and that uh, that was um, convened under NASB and I thank Kathy and, and John for allowing me to do that. The work group um, is now, we and I'll just try to rush through this. Um, Don't rush, take your time. <laughs> okay. So the work group was convened and uh, the purpose of the work group is really to look at this issue of co college and career <coughs> readiness. Um, understanding that uh, college and career readiness is usually um, talked about around competency, Carnegie units, um, project-based learning strategies, and just really that several groups, um, a cross-sector of folks are really looking at career um, tech education and what their role is uh, within that. About across the country, there's about 32 states that have a definition around um, career readiness or our state, and I see that Patty is here and she can speak to this uh, more so than I do, but um, actually the work group was, was somewhat fond of Michigan's definition of, of college and uh, career readiness. And we look at a student as college and career readiness as someone who possesses skills necessary to earn self-sustaining wage and participate in post-secondary opportunities without remediation. Um, and this is just a look at um, the lifelong learning skills, um, 21st century skills that are required. And this is um, a model that's based on a review of 22 industries. These are the members. There were seven, seven members, and then we also were facilitated by uh, Lori, Lori Meyer. And you can look at where we were from, from across the, the country. Um, some of the things that we, we were asked to do is to come to our state, um, talk to those folks who um, are familiar with college and career uh, readiness. Um, one of the meetings that we had was with uh, Patty. I was in close conversation with her. We also talked to Liz Baker, former uh, board member here, and then we also convened with Stephanie Comey from um, MEDC, Michigan Economic Development Corporation, as well as um, Flint, um, Flint's Mott Community College. So the study group, um, we met over the months of January, March, and June, and we heard from experts, um, 18 experts. You can look at, I think it's page 17, 18, 17 through 19, you can look and you can see what our references were. On the front of the cover, you'll look to see um, who <coughs> those experts were. But it was business. We had representatives from the U.S. Chamber, um, programs such as ju Junior Achievement, um, universities and community college, um, which, again, you will hear from um, Beverly in just a moment. Um, and she was one of those, those co uh, representing com community college along with um, a university that she's worked with. Um, education systems, we also heard from testing and assessment. Um, Michelle, um, Eileen, we definitely heard from National Center for Learning Disabilities of, about what are some of the model programs that are going on in the country around making sure that we're engaging those with special needs. We also heard from chief state school officers. So again, you can look and you can find those actual folks as well as their resource materials. Um, really the overarching um, thought here at the end of the day, which we do know, is that ensuring the state board policies value career readiness. Um, building knowledge and understanding of post-secondary business and workforce initiatives, engaging with a broad spectrum of stakeholders to define career readiness, um, and reframing this issue for some communities. Um, really happy, if you look at page um, nine um, of the document, really talking about the historical factors. I know uh, in many urban districts, I know in researching, one of the uh, assignments that I did is went to my uh, CTE program uh, in Saginaw, uh, as well as meeting with the group that I talked to you about and meeting with some <coughs> employers who are looking at career readiness. I went to Flint um, and met with one of the employers there. Uh, and really taking a look and looking at um, one of the things that's, that is disheartening 
is that within urban districts, a lot of times the students are not necessarily engaging in CTE programs, and that's because um, of the bad connotation that has been there, and um, justifiably so. And so we really took a lot of time really emphasizing what were some of the reasons and what are some of the reasons. I'll go back to my own district um, in Saginaw, um, in my home district, and we saw that, you know, I was able to see that that was happening, that now, now we have uh, students who are coming from some of our magnet schools who are more apt to participate in the CTE programs than some of the students from some of the urban districts. And so if you look at page nine, we really did focus and wanted to make mention of those reasonings why that may be happening, as well as making sure that we're reframing uh, what our thoughts are around when we talk about this um, career readiness. On page 12, we talk about career ready, a career ready person effectively navigating pathways that connect education and employment to achieve a fulfilling, financially secure, and successful career. So looking more than just a job, making sure that students and parents feel that students are being placed on a pathway to have a fulfilling um, future versus um, looking at just jobs. Of course, we all know why, again, why we would want to do this. A business Roundtable, um, for instance, looked at 95% 95, 95 of businesses that were um, assessed said indicated a skill shortage within their company. So just this national thought that, that we can no longer put this on the back burner um, and that we really have to, um, I think at the end of the day, um, as I quickly um, turn over to Beverly, is really defining um, one of the biggest overarching outcomes was making sure that we're defining what we mean by career readiness, that it's not a definition that we're just coming up with because we have to. Um, making sure that we're ensuring that, local, that state boards of education are driving this issue. Um, I had the opportunity to go along with the NASME dele uh, delegate to the to a CTE national conference um, and some of the local board members that were within that room were really happy to hear that state boards are really taking this issue on and, and driving it. And I know that this state board and John, your work that, that you're actually doing that. We've, um, Brian, you've talked about looking at our definition um, of career readiness, so we're already um, ahead on doing that, and that's within our priorities as well. So that's the first thing, making sure that policies value career readiness. Looking um, at the assessments, making sure that we're, you know, not just saying it, not just naming it, but also making sure that it's incorporated with all, within all um, systems. So making sure that the assessments um, incorporate this, how do we um, make sure that assessments incorporate career readiness, teacher prep and um, professional development, and again, looking holistically. Um, there's so many different groups that when we talk about this issue, whether it's falling under CTE, whether it's, fall, um, you know, we're pretty much governed by ESEA, um, but it also falls under so many other um, federal um, funded programs. So making sure that all of those groups and, and having state boards or um, and Michigan Department of Education to drive that convening and be the conveners of, of those different groups. So um, that is the report. Here is the report. Um, so again, as I talked about our next steps, uh, next steps would be making sure that this board is helping MDE to to drive those discussions. And so now I do want to turn over to, uh, to Beverly because she was one of the presenters. Um, and she is uh, in Genesee County. We're happy to hear that they are doing a program called Pipeline to Promise, which is based off of a program that she did in Montgomery County. Um, in Maryland that was an ACES program, and that program was with uh, Montgomery College and Shady Grove College, or universities. University. Mm -hmm. So I'll turn it over to Beverly. Do we have the power? Probably. Let's see here. Is it on the desktop? Yep. Well, I want to thank 
uh, the State Board for allowing me to speak today about Pipeline to Promise, and especially Pamela for all of her support that she has given us through the inception of this until now. Pipeline to Promise is a K through 16 retention and completion plan that is really listed and working with the partnerships of all that you see with you um, on the screen. Um, Mock Community College took the lead. University of Michigan Flint is one of the partners for the transfer. Genesee, Genesee Intermediate School District has worked diligently to ensure that all school superintendents <coughs> had the opportunity to um, join this partnership. And you see the four um, entities that decided that they wanted to be a part of the Pipeline to Promise experience. The planning team, I'd like for you to see that that varies from community members to the superintendents to provost at University of Michigan Flint. Um, Pam has been a part of that as well, to also um, various members of the Mock Community College family. This is not a new initiative, um, as Pam has said. Uh, it really started with Northern Virginia Community College um, coming forth. Um, to say that we needed to have intrusive coaching to get our students through high school and into college and through college to actually graduate. And so they took that aspect and that thought pattern and came up with Pathways to the Baccalaureate program, which started at 11th grade. When I got to Montgomery College a few years ago, um, my president at the time knew about that program program and heard about that program and had seen the good that it was doing in the areas that it was serving. And so we had an issue in Montgomery County. If you know Montgomery County in Maryland, you know that it's one of the wealthiest in the country. But what was happening and what is still continuing to happen is that it's becoming poorer, it's becoming darker, and it's becoming older. And she had the foresight and the vision to say, we don't want two Montgomery counties sprouting out. We need to make sure that we have one Montgomery County and everyone has the ability to complete high school, to go to college, and to get a baccalaureate degree. And so she worked with, um, as Pamela said, the Universities of Shady Grove, um, which is a University of Maryland, where they offer in Montgomery County um, all of the programs from all of their University of Maryland programs across the state right there in Montgomery <coughs> County on a campus and um, Montgomery um, County Public Schools. The opportunity, she got with those leaders and said, we need to do something. And she said, it can't start at 11th grade and it can't just be about the student. It has to be about the family and we need to go to 9th grade to start this program. I was the lead person for Montgomery College to get it done, and so we came up with and started the program Achieving Collegiate Excellence, or ACES, which has actually been to the White House and showcased there. So it's been a wonderful program for retention and completion of a baccalaureate degree. So when I got hired here as president of Mott, and I've been here about 17 months now, and I knew that that was one of the reasons that I was hired, that my board wanted to see this come to fruition, that we would have a similar type <coughs> program. And so I started early on um, in my tenure seeking out and working with those that you saw to see how we could put this together. But the one thing that I noticed very early was we couldn't start at ninth grade. We have too many that we lose when you look at the data, and I know you're the state board, so you know the data, um, that we lose them coming out of elementary, and then middle, and then very few get to that high school completion. And so I said, okay, we're gonna start a kindergarten. Because what we have found, and what I know that you know, is kindergarten is the most engaging point for those parents so that we can start those children right. And this really is about not going to college, but transforming a culture into a culture of learning and student success. So the program vision, there are six of them there. 
Erasing academic and economic <coughs> inequalities is number one. This is about family transformation and culture. It's intentionally creating pathways so that students and families can succeed. It's about the parents understanding and knowing how to access the resources needed for themselves and their students. Because I really latched on to the part about we need to include parents on this. Because if we don't have the parents, and I had a conversation last night with the parent, if we don't have that person buying in and getting all of the resources that they need, then it's not going to filter down to the student. If the culture is going to change, you have to work with the nucleus of that entire family structure. It has to be a collaborative effort where we all work together as one to ensure that all students and all families have the resources, the strategies, and the success that they can at every level. It has to come from the county as well to say that we want this for our success. And then finally, the last vision is that we are not, as I said, just talking about getting people through college. It's actually creating employee supply chains because it's college and career readiness. It's about, in the end, coming back, staying in our county, and finding jobs that are jobs that will create um, economic viability for the families and our community. So the key program interventions, the number one key is that you have coaching throughout the academic student cycle. Intrusive, family, case management approach of coaching so that we are not having people come to us. We are actually going to them. We're actually following up. We're actually saying to the families, what resources do you need? So that they don't have to feel that embarrassed or, or whatever that may keep them fearful. We're always knowing where they are, who they are, and then pushing them a little bit to get where we know that they want to be as families. Career development, exploration, and readiness um, are key factors within this. Ensuring that families are making decisions that are good decisions for the students in the family at each stage of the game. Making sure that they know about financial aid and the importance of that and how to actually fill out those forms. Learning about community and cohort building models that actually start right there in kindergarten providing summer experiences throughout this program at the different developmental age groups so that students start knowing very early what college is about. I've been on a college campus. I understand it. I want to go. And then early continuous investment by all the participating institutions to ensure that our students will succeed. The three levels um, for P2P. Level one is preparing for success. Level two is providing the college success and decision making for careers in the community college. And level three, the transfer college success and tailored career success skills. I do want to say a difference between Montgomery and P2P is that Montgomery was focused on a bachelor's degree because they felt that was what was going to be needed in Montgomery County. For P2P, we are focusing on a college credential because as you've heard and you've heard Pam talk about, we know that there are many different jobs that you can get a certificate with and still earn a great amount of money to support your family. The target audience, we're not going for the high um, achieving student or the very low student because we know that they're already getting those resources. This is for those average achieving students that often get lost in the shuffle. There's nothing there for them. Everybody's concentrating on the other ends. And so those are the ones that we really want to look at in those um, target groups that you see there. And then you see 
that these are <coughs> um, the different types of activities that will happen at the different levels. Um, for the elementary school students, a lot of focus um, going in on elementary school to get them started with those cultural changes that we want you in school, learning is fun, and these are the things that we want you to do so that you can mm -hmm. learn so much that will take you into middle school. And we know those are the tough years. And so working with the coaches through the middle school, these are the different <coughs> things that um, we're wanting those coaches to do. Notice that the intrusive case management continues. And then that bridges them into high school. And that's when we start really concentrating on the career readiness kinds of things with the job shadowing, internships, um, personal and career electronic portfolios, those kinds of things for career and college readiness. And we bridge them into the community college that then takes them into confirming which way they're going to go and really works with them hand on, in hand to ensure that they make it through us and they make the decision again, do I want to go further or do I want to go out and get a job? If it's get a job, we'll help with that too. And it's bridged into the University of Michigan Flint that has a more tailored look at getting them through a baccalaureate degree if they so choose. And so the impact is the same at what the vision is. We believe that we can transform our culture, our communities, we can erase the academic and economic inequalities if we look at this as a holistic academic program that helps families move through the process, it gives them structure, it gives them information, it gives them hope that success and financial stability is at the end. All right, any questions? Can you define intrusive case management for me? <laughs> In your face. Okay. <laughs> In your face, yes. That was the part about not having them come to us. We go to them. We don't allow them to give excuses. Mm -hmm. Kathleen and then Rick. No, thank you very much. I'm glad to hear about this program, <coughs> but I also had the question about going to the parents. Are they welcoming? Do they, or do they push you away? Where is it accommodation? It depends on the parent. Um, I'm going to talk about the experience from ACES because this is what we want to do um, in Genesee County. Um, some are very welcoming. They understand this. Some don't really want anything to do with the program, and so we don't force that. We then work with just that student to make sure that they get the information and the relationship that they need. But I will say that it was very few parents that were pushing away. I'm Most working. really wanted it. And the key, <coughs> are, the key part of this is the hiring of the coaches. You have to hire people that have a passion for working with a population that may be um, thought of as underserved. Um, one of the most brilliant things when I was going through the hiring process of our coaches was we were talking about at-risk youth. And she said, they're not at risk, they're at promise. <coughs> that's what we want all of them to think because that's how you work well with many populations. Rick, and then we'll go to Eileen and then Cassandra. I really applaud this initiative for a lot of reasons, but perhaps more, most importantly is it creates a culture, sort of a beginning to end from preschool to, to college, that, that this is possible. And we all know the expression, you don't know what you don't know. But you're bridging that education gap, but then you're putting structural supports in place that actually establish concrete um, 
relationships and also a vision. And this is so critical for these students because if you don't know what's out there, then you can't avail yourself of the opportunities. And I also appreciate the access, especially for first generation college students to financial aid, because as we know from the first generation documentary film that was aired um, at, the, at the MDE conference in the fall, <coughs> um, there's a lot of support out there, but people just don't know that it, that it exists. And so just getting the word out and establishing a culture that yes, you ought to be college and career ready and here are some possible pathways. It just opens up all kinds of hopeful paths that, that make sense. So thank you. Eileen and then Cassandra. Uh, th this is an extraordinary program and I'm very excited about it. What I'd love to see, although I think it's going to take a while, this is the second year it's been in place or the first? It is not in place yet. Ah. We are proposing it and we're looking for funding. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because I'd love to see the statistics after three or four years for retention of those kids in ninth grade as they graduate from middle school. Uh, uh, those are, <coughs> besides 11th and 12th, ninth is the hardest hit for kids trying right. to figure out where to fit in. And I would think that this would have all the promise in the world. <clears throat> to help keep them stable and keep them in school. It's extraordinary. Thank you so much. Right, and Montgomery has, you know, done that from ninth grade and they have wonderful statistics. Yeah, sure they do. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sandra? So you've actually just answered one of my questions. Um, I, too, work for a community college. I know what our budgets look like these days. Um, how much do you, I was going to ask how you're paying for it, but how much do you anticipate it will cost? And, and also, what kind of data do you anticipate collecting so that you can demonstrate the success of the program? Um, we have several outcome measures that we're looking at. Some of the very early ones are absenteeism, and I'm talking from the elementary absenteeism, um, the, the grades that they're accumulating at that time, and are they progressing through. That's on a student side. On the family side and the parents, it really is about looking at their needs as well. And so looking at um, what resources are out there, what resources are needed um, to get them employed, to get them a GED or a college credential, whatever that is. Um, it really does move, when we're looking at this, the retention is number one. And then, of course, it is the, um, the academic progress as they're moving through. So we have a number of measures that I have a subgroup that's working on all of that for the outcomes. But those are the main ones. At Montgomery, when they really looked at um, their first data that came out, they found that the students were more likely to come to school. They were more likely their grades increased. It was like by almost like a half a point in this group if they were in the program. It was just phenomenal just by having that coach to help them. And what do you anticipate the cost of the program? It, it is in your packet, and I'm okay. sorry I didn't go through what is in your packet. But if you look on the left side, there is a top 10. It's just a quick and dirty of what the program is about. It's a listing of the planning team members. And then on the other side is a detailed plan description, a proposal of activities that can take place. And then the budget is there at the end. All right, thank you very much. Look forward to maybe a future report on success. Yes, great. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. The next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is a presentation on student suspension and expulsion. This presentation will provide information on data collection regarding suspension and expulsions. And we have Kyle Granat, Deputy Superintendent of Administrative and School Support Services. I think he wasn't sure earlier. We'll see if had you've had your energy drink now, okay. And then Tom Hall, Director of Center for Educational Performance and, in and Information. Tom, thanks for being here. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Tom, for joining us today. Um, originally, this, the, this presentation was born out of a, a, a question that was posed to uh, several board members around expulsion data um, and the uh, opportunity or potential to uh, um, 
put that data essentially out more in the light, uh, make it more available to the public by linking it to uh, school report cards. So that's really kind of what led to this presentation. So our uh, Tom and I's uh, kind of focus today is I want to talk about the policy environment that we're currently working in when it comes to suspension and expulsion. Tom's going to talk a little bit about the data collection and what the data um, shows, not only for this, but in terms of broader attendance data and, um, you, you and then some of the resources and supports we're trying to provide to school to keep kids in school. So uh, as you're aware, that you know, this is not a new topic for the board. The board's been very interested in, in uh, this, this topic over the last two to three years and have uh, passed uh, two recent policies, the policy on reducing student suspension expulsions in May of 2014, as well as the mo uh, uh, <coughs> amending the model code of conduct to um, revisit zero tolerance policies and ways to address uh, student discipline without relying on suspension expulsions. So what are the ways that we can keep a safe and orderly environment, but also keep kids in school? Uh, currently, um, these are the kind of the, the highlights of the, the current data collection as it relates to suspension and expulsion. Schools are required to report the number of expulsions and incidents of crime um, to us, but schools are not re required to uh, report suspensions. There is a, a field that's essentially optional for schools to report, um, except when it um, involves students that are receiving special education services. Um, and there's also no common definition, no statewide definition of, of truancy, which makes it hard to implement effective truancy policies at the local level. Um, uh, the governor asked uh, the Department of Then and uh, then the Department of Human Services to develop a statewide uh, definition of truancy, and um, board members participated on that group that uh, took a year to, to do that, and it's working their way through the legislative process right now, and we'll talk a little about, about that um, at the end. But I'm going to turn over to Tom now to walk through some of the data collected, including um, some recently attended, uh, recently released statewide attendance uh, data that really paints a broader picture of um, where kids are in terms of in school and how we can, how they are aren't in school on a regular basis. Okay, thanks, Kyle. All right, just very briefly, uh, discipline data is collected through the Michigan Student Data System. It is collected at the individual level, uh, so any expulsion that occurs in public education is reported through that system. Uh, that way we're able to tie it to various uh, demographics and other information so we can get a better handle on where we have challenges on the discipline front. Uh, for special ed students, uh, the Individuals with Disability Education Act does require a bit more extensive reporting. Uh, as Kyle alluded to, we gather more information on students that have an active IEP than we do on any other student in the state. And that's under federal rule. Um, and that is why uh, we handle in that fashion. The types of inc incidences that are reported to the state uh, include firearm possession, <coughs> other weapon possession, illegal drugs, alcohol, bombs or similar threats, arson, other physical violence, and tobacco incidents. The graph you have in front of you shows the frequency in which the most recent data submitted for school year 2015 uh, showed the types of incidents that are resulting in expulsions of students in any um, public education category. Uh, the biggest issue right now is prohibited behavior, so that would be something where a student has violated the code of conduct within the district in such a way that would require that they be expelled, um, followed by drugs and et cetera, weapons, can go down the list there. Um, importantly, looking from left to right, um, you should see that the totals are decreasing, so the number of expulsions in our districts is on uh, a good trend, a downward trend. Uh, the current year was 1,257 expulsions. Uh, the, the higher year in 2013 on the other end was just shy of 1,600 expulsions. So um, I think districts are working hard to keep kids in school and make sure they're on task with their learning. All right, this is a slide just focusing on discipline data. So again, uh, for students with an active IEP, the districts have to report a bit more information. We get the incident ID, uh, when the incident occurred, the type of incident that occurred, whether or not there was serious bodily injury, whether or not sexual assault was involved. Um, they, they share whether or not consequences were issued. And within those consequences, there can be several different things that are reported. We do know the number of days that a student is decided assigned a consequence, and we know the start and end date of that consequence. Um, this slide in particular is showing you um, really the overall, if you look from left to right, 2014 to 2015, we've seen a decrease in the number of incidents that required the removal of a student from their learning environment. So we're down from about 29,500 incidents in 2014. We're down about 
Yeah, just over one and a half percent to about 29,000 incidents in 2015. Um, <coughs> and the converse, however, in special ed, for out-of-school suspensions, the, um, the number of students increased by about 1.3 percent in terms of the number of students that their, their ramifications for their behavior resulted in removing them from uh, the school completely <coughs> uh, for a period of time. So that's uh, a trend to keep in mind as you're thinking about suspension and expulsion um, issues. Uh, the next slide focuses a little bit on kind of conversation we're going to get to in a minute around attendance, but really focusing on the discipline side. So for uh, students that have more than 10 occurrences um, of removal from their learning environment or from school, uh, we really see a fairly steady trend that would suggest that if a student has other disciplinary problems, um, they're actually twice as likely to have more than 10 absences from the learning environment. So it could be a ramification of uh, a removal from a classroom, could be a disengagement. So if they're getting tr in trouble at school, um, they're probably more apt, according to the data, to miss more time out of school. So it, it further interrupts their learning opportunity. Kathleen, did you have a question? Yeah, I wondered, in, in this uh, chart, what are the uh, prosperity uh, regions? I apologize, Kathleen. Um, the reality is the prosperity regions, it was just a different way to look at the data. Uh, I apologize, I should have included a map in that slide. Um, the governor's office often looks around the state by larger regions. So rather than focusing on an ISD or a district, we look at a larger spectrum. So um, in Michigan, Region 7, so at the bottom of the slide you see South Central Prosperity Region. That is Clinton, Eaton, and Ingham County. So it's a tri-county area. Oh. And in that so we, what we can get you a list of yeah. what each of these okay. regions. There is a map later in the presentation that breaks okay. out the, oh. the oh, okay. regions so you'll be able to see. Okay. So just a different way to focus on different pockets and segments of the I've state. I've never heard that term before. I apologize. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, there is other discipline data. Uh, Kyle talked about truancy a bit earlier. Uh, truancy, because of the lack of a consistent definition for um, both uh, excused absences and unexcused absences across districts, it's difficult to get a good gauge on truancy in Michigan because of the inconsistency and definition that's locally administered. Um, that type of information is gathered through our school infrastructure database. I did not bring that to show you today. We've found that data to be of uneven quality over time. And for purposes of this conversation, uh, we made the determination that it probably wouldn't be that helpful um, to, to what we're trying to accomplish here. Other crime and safety statistics that are gathered are less about simply the student behavior and they're about the learning environment or the school and district environment. So it could include incidents that could be visitors in a building that are causing a ruckus or a problem, or it could be something that happens off-site uh, during a field trip or uh, an outing like an athletic event. So that type of information we didn't bring to the table today. Um, attendance in Michigan is defined as a student participating in any amount of instructional time. We do not collect class by class Assign, um, attendance data in Michigan. So if a student attends when attendance is taken for a district on a particular day of instruction, they're counted as a day in attendance. And a day possible for attendance in Michigan is defined as any day where instruction has taken place. So on a snowy day like today, if you happen to, superintendent happened to bring the kids into the school and you held even one hour of instructional services, that would be considered a day of attendance for purposes of student attendance tracking. All right, again, that's collected at the individual level. That's collected in <coughs> aggregate at the individual level. So we collect the total number of days that a student attends school out of the total number of days possible. Yes, sir? Quick question here. Am I reading the, the chart right? There's only a 1% difference in the rate between K to 5 and 6 to 12? Right, so if you look, um, overall our rates have been relatively stable in Michigan. Okay. Uh, we decided to break it up by elementary versus secondary, so yes, K through 5 and then 6 through 12, and let you see that there's not a huge discrepancy overall when you look across the entire state. There's not a huge discrepancy between the attendance rate at an elementary school versus at a secondary learning environment. All right, I can go through that. 
again, by the numbers, um, been relatively stable over time. Um, I, I, it trends up and down depending on the year, but we've not seen appreciable change in the overall attendance rate um, in public schools in Michigan. I think an interesting data point really is the trend we see uh, with enrollment when you compare that to absences. Um, back in 2010, we had about 1.57 million by headcount students in our public <laughs> school system. Uh, in school year 2015, we had just shy of 1.5 million. So you saw a downward trend, trend of enrollment by about 600,000 kids. But students with more than 10 absences remains relatively stable. We're seeing about 420,000 students a year that miss at least 10 or more days of school. Um, that is about a 2% increase over time from 2010 to 2015. So while we're seeing the enrollment drop, we're seeing that trend of students missing school actually increasing if you look at that as a percentage of the overall enrollment. another way to break down the attendance data we did it by locale code so that you could take a look and say is this an urban problem is this a rural <coughs> problem is this something we have as a challenge in our uh, suburban communities um, again by the numbers and looking at locations both extremes both the cities and the rural so the green line and the orange line represent cities and the rural communities the districts and schools in those communities have uh, probably the lowest uh, attendance rates and we are not looking at that gray bar that is uh, not specified on our chart. Uh, not specified would point to things like juvenile detention centers um, and other maybe state-run environments where it's a little bit more challenging. I think to um, there's less <laughs> control by a parent and a student in a school in terms of that learning environment. In terms of the traditional schools, we see the biggest problems uh, with attendance rates being in our cities and our, our very rural communities. The next slide, uh, in the past we really talked about truancy. Uh, that was defined as 10 or more unexcused absences. Without the consistent definition, um, nationally the conversation has been more about a focus on missed learning opportunity. So we look at, uh, regardless of the reason, do we have a chronic absenteeism problem with students? So that's, that's what we're starting to measure. Um, looking down the road, the federal government, U.S. Department of Education, has indicated that they would like to tighten up the way they compare states. So state to state, they want us to start reporting, rather than 10 or more absences, they're going to get into looking at 10% or more which would show us something a little bit different. Um, if you had a student that's mobile and moves between environments, um, they probably don't have the same opportunity to hit that 174 school days or 180 days. They might only have 50 or 70 days in a particular learning environment. If they miss 10%, then that's a number that would get picked up. Um, it'd probably pick up a few more students that are mobile. It might drop off some of the students that are less mobile in these computations. Again, relatively stable numbers. Um, looking from left to right, um, you know, we're still, we're hovering right around 27 to 28 percent, and I apologize, there's an error on that slide. It didn't pick up the percentages. Uh, in 2012, it was 27.4 percent. 2013 was 28.5 percent. 2014 was 25.5 percent. And in 2015, our most recent data year was 27.8 percent. And those are students that are chronically absent as defined currently by 10 or more absences. We took a look at to see if this was an issue of race or ethnicity. I broke the data down a little bit differently. Uh, it's important to note that both counts and percentages are important. So if you're looking at this from a policy perspective, if you look strictly at counts, you would see that uh, black or African American students and white students would be your largest target populations. Uh, that have the most chronically absent students. But if you look at the percentages of students, you see a very different picture. Um, you, you see we pick up many other races and ethnicities, um, most prominently American Indian and Alaskan Natives, 40.6% of those students have a chronic absenteeism challenge. But we only have 4,200 of those students in our state. So again, the numbers don't necessarily tell you uh, the whole story of the situation. So it's important to look at both of those contexts as you're reviewing the data. 
The next slide, we look at uh, chronic absent students by district type. Do we have a bigger challenge in our LEAs or our PSAs? Uh, overall, the trends for both remain relatively stable, which would suggest that your data is probably relatively even and stable and reliable. Uh, over time, public school academies have experienced approximately 9% more chronic absenteeism than their LEA peers. Again, an interesting data point could be um, really the, the students that they serve, the types of circumstances in which they exist versus, versus the LEA. Um, the data does not tell you why that trend exists. It certainly points out that it's something that you could take a look at. And that was the last data point, Kyle. I know I went through those relatively quickly. I anticipate you guys have some questions. Sure, sure. Real quickly before we do that, just to talk a little bit about the resource environment that we're working in trying to support schools and keeping kids in schools. In October, we presented uh, the final outcomes of our Safe and Supportive Schools grant, which is the first bullet on this slide, and talked about the nearly 30,000 days of, uh, of instruction that were saved through um, pra practices like restorative justice in the 23 high party high schools that we were working with. So we know that there are evidence-based things that are out there that if schools implement effectively help support, again, addressing behavior and keeping a safe and orderly environment, but also keeping kids in school uh, at the same time. Um, all of these grants really focus on uh, the importance of improving the school's climate and culture, um, leading to less disciplinary referrals, and, and sometimes you need to address the behavior that goes <coughs> along with that or the, the kind of underlying um, issues that cause that behavior. So, for instance, in our, our Project AWARE uh, work, we're working with three um, uh, ISD, their ISD level grants that each ISD is getting approximately $425,000 a year over a five year period. The focus really is on um, promoting mental health and wellness, you know, through um, increasing access to services, um, really uh, adjusting the policy environment um, within them to uh, increase student um, uh, availability of services for mental health. So, again, if a student has mental health issues that, you know, that, that may, and it's, they're going un, un, unaddressed. You know, that plays itself out in the classroom in the school environment as behaviors that aren't conducive to learning and which ultimately leads to suspension and expulsion so um, some of the work again focuses on policy but also focuses on the underlying behavior um, that is causing students to act out in the school environment and thus um, causing them to be suspended or expelled uh, we've talked about uh, the michigan school justice partnership before at this table um, Michelle Fecht has been a very active uh, member of it, but it's an uh, interagency group that uh, involves uh, uh, DHS, uh, the court system, and the child welfare groups, and state universities, again, to really look at zero tolerance policies, uh, prison to pipeline, other issues. There are 79 county teams uh, right now that are, are looking at a county level on one, trying to align truancy definitions, trying to get a better handle uh, across the county level on attendance patterns and behaviors to make sure everybody's starting from the same page and implementing and uh, identifying resources to implement effective strategies like restorative practices and other things that keep kids in school. Uh, and finally, um, the proposed legislation that I referred to earlier, um, the, these bills were originally introduced uh, in 2014. Uh, they did not, um, they had a committee hearing uh, in the Senate uh, Education Committee, but then uh, needed to be reintroduced uh, this past year, which they were, um, and they're sponsored by Senator Shootmaker and um, um, uh, Judy Edmonds are the two sponsors of these bills. Uh, they're broken down essentially 405 and 406 really focus on the truancy work that we've talked about earlier, coming up with a common statewide definition um, and uh, adding reporting requirements for suspension of chronic absenteeism. Um, and then uh, 407 and 408 focus on the prison of pipeline and, and um, addressing some of our zero tolerance policies <coughs> that are in uh, existing law that are over and above the federal requirements um, on state when it comes to mandatory expulsions. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Brian and we're happy to answer any, any questions. Any questions? So, yeah, uh, first we go to uh, Eileen and then to Richard. <coughs> Thank you. I'm not sure I understood everything, but I know I have food for thought. Um, and I, I've been very concerned about, as, as have all the board members, very concerned about school to prison pipeline. Um, I'm also curious as to whether these statistics reflect accurately uh, digital or distance learning. Uh, how, how do you 
work in a situation where a number of the um, uh, alternative programs for kids, I had a wonderful presentation about four or five years ago from a young woman who had gotten pregnant, had dropped out of school, and was able through, actually it wasn't that long ago, through way, mm -hmm. through uh, one of the way schools to be able to work her way back through a GED, mm -hmm. actually, or a high school degree. But how do you reflect that? Because those kids may not be in, uh, work online every day, mm -hmm. and they, or they may be doing one hour and then 10 or, or work weekends. So how do you? I don't know that's <coughs> Yeah, um, the department uh, through their their internal audit area, uh, Neil McCreffman, mm -hmm. uh, works with the Michigan Pupil Attendance and Accounting Association, and together they come up with the rules that kind of govern how we account and keep track of students in our state, and what's legitimately a way to count days of attendance. Um, they look at things like seat time waivers, virtual course participation, um, homebound or hospitalized students, or other non-traditional students, and they make rules and proxies for how you would count attendance. So uh, in cyber learning or online learning, uh, I know they focus on um, the number of um, uh, connections, virtual connections directly from a proctor um, and a student, and they count that as a day of learning. Um, so they might not have to hit a 174-day mark, but there are a number of um, opportunities where the student and the proctor of the particular course need to connect, and they track those, and that's how they keep track of attendance for those students. So then if I could just ask a quick uh, follow-up. Michigan Virtual presented last month, mm -hmm. and one of the questions that they provided some answers to were, was the quality, by accident, the quality of, of certain programs that were district offered but were not uh, really, uh, you know, kids were failing them. Do you have enough ability to do data analysis to see whether there's any relationship between how often they're logging in? I mean, does that, can anybody do that to see whether they're really participating? I don't think the data quality is there yet. Uh, we don't track the number of logins, so it would be up to the, the course delivery entity to determine how many logins would constitute attendance. So unfortunately, I don't know that we could directly answer how many logins it would take to correlate that to success in a particular course. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, Richard, and then Pam, please. Um, uh, I've got two <laughs> sets of questions, I guess. Uh, one is um, if a student uh, is in a public school and then enrolls in a private school, say Catholic school, um, uh, and is that student become chronically absent until the transfer is affected or until, until records are affected or if, or if they move out of state, do they become, and there's no mm -hmm. subsequent word back to the school, are they carried on the books? No, they're not, they're not carried on the books. Um, they can be transferred out. Uh, when a student transfers out, a school district has an opportunity through something called student record maintenance where they can tell the state the effective date that a student left their learning environment. So in your instance, if the school didn't immediately tell the state that the student had left for the Catholic school, they can tell us at their oppor first opportunity the effective date of that student's move out of their, their school system. So we can track that and do know the exit, uh, the effective exit date of the student. And, and what, um, what financial ramifications are there for the school when a student transfers out? So if they transfer out to a non-public school learning environment, there is no financial ramification for the public school. If they transfer from one public school to another public school in our state between the fall count date, which is the fourth Wednesday of the school, fifth Wednesday of the school year, uh, or the secondary or supplemental count date, which is in February, the money follows the student. So there's a pro rata process that goes on where we up at the data world take a look at the effective date of those movements. A district may request those funds. The receiving district can request the funds. And the Office of State Aid and School Finance, under Kyle's um, guidance, make sure that money is transferred to the new district that's serving the student. And then my other uh, set of questions or issue here is looking at the um, uh, chart on the bottom of page three, I was very surprised to see uh, the Metro Detroit um, chronically absent is actually less than two of these other regions. We often hear academic problems in Detroit schools attributed to high absentee, and yet 
as a region, they seem to be less than other other parts of the districts in the state. Is this include Detroit and, and suburbs? Is there a breakdown between uh, Wayne County and I, and I guess the surrounding counties? So you're looking at the prosperity regions. I apologize. Yes. I don't have the number. Yeah, Detroit Metro prosperity yep. region. Um, Boy, my glasses fail me right now, but um, the Tr Detroit Metro Prosperity Region includes Oakland, uh, Wayne, and Macomb counties. All right, so I am I'm supposing that behind this 32 percent is much lower percent for some of the suburban schools and the higher percent for the urban schools. Right. We just didn't choose okay. today for expediency in this conversation to go delineate that by district, but we could certainly provide you with that information. Okay. That, that would be helpful just to help us get a, a, a clear picture of Detroit and what's happening there. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're going to move to Pam and then Joan. So my first question is, did you say, I miss, I'm sorry, I missed it, is the data public? Is this data public? It is public information. Uh, we, all of these particular charts and graphs are not necessarily out on the My School Data portal. Okay. That's something that we manage with the department. Uh, we put a lot of transparency behind the information that school districts have been providing us for years. Okay. So I think we're finally at a point in time where we're providing that back to the schools and to the taxpayers and making connections and observations that we've been um, slow to make available okay the so then the causation or the reason for the absenteeism that is on the my school data. yeah there is okay. a, there are attendance rates and that in, does include the chronic absenteeism conversation at www.myschooldata.org okay. okay. and then the other um, question that I have and I'm, I'm not sure um, bill 4 441 house bill um, the parental responsibility act when did that go into went to effect and have we tracked any data to see if that's causing um, a downward trend which I don't think that would be but um, that would be interesting to see and then the other thing that I would be interested in knowing and I, and I know that this is probably going to be difficult to know as well looking at the health of the parents you know as we're talking about special needs of children are we looking at the mental and physical health of parents? Because I know that that could be a huge reason for some of these numbers as we look at the, the chronic um, absenteeism or, uh, you know, students being chronically late, um, which would fall into that. And some, I mean, some of those pieces, to, to your question, to answer that question, I would say a little bit. I mean, through the, through the governor's work on the uh, Mental Health and Wellness Commission, I mean, there are specific pieces around um, addressing the needs of adults and their mental health needs. Um, I think there's also, you know, things like pathways of potential that are are dealing with maybe not mental health aspects or other barriers that um, uh, help keep kids out of school. Or, you know, that are are being barriers to so parents getting kids to school, whether it's you know clean uniforms or that's alarm clocks or that's kind of daily necessities that you know can be taken for granted sometimes that are really cru crucial in some of our our higher needs communities that you know trying to address those barriers so that way those aren't the barriers that are are leading to kids being chronically absent and I, or late and i'll be just real quick and and i know like the pathways to potential what the purpose of it is and it's good and i you know know that the intentions are well intended but you know i think that there's a lot of work that still has to be done as we as these things actually touch the ground and how they play out um, because i've had calls from parents no parents who have multiple issues and you know, them getting their student, their kids to school is a priority, but because of the multiple issues, and then they get these calls from some of these programs that just compound those issues, if that makes sense. So, um, just some thoughts as we continue to work on this. Thank you, Pam. John? Thank you all for this. Um, so, two quick questions. Is it, is it fair to say we're making a little bit of headway on reducing expulsion, and is that a, a data reporting change or is it a real change that we're figuring out how to do better by these kids? The data points themselves have not changed. They've been relatively stable um, at least since 2004. So I think the programs and services and the way schools are operating uh, is is making an impact on those numbers. So second question, what would be the major things that we should do to do better and keep kids in school and treat them differently? Is it is it to expand the, and enhance or keep at the Michigan School Justice Partnership type of work with 
folks? Is it to end the zero tolerance policies uh, once and for all? Or what combination do you think would be most powerful, do you think, to, to, to reduce that school to prison pipeline and just, just mm -hmm. or, you know, the bad stuff? I think, I think it's a combination of, of two to three things. One is is the resource piece around the what some of the, the Justice Partnership is pushing in terms of changing the policy environment, um, implementing effective strategies, whether it's you know directly through schools or in many cases it's partnerships with you know nonprofit um, community-based organizations around implementing things like restorative practices, you know, really changing the conversation around student discipline from a punitive um, kind of perspective to a, a more <coughs> kind of teach and learn perspective, again, addressing the behavior, keeping an orderly environment, but doing that in a way that allows kids to still be engaged in the learning environment. Um, and then also the data collection piece of it. I mean, the expulsions only tell a, a narrowed scope of, of the, of the um, conversation. And we've got, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of days of suspension that are out there. And when you look at the national data and what that says about who's in and out of school and who are more susceptible to suspensions, we know that our youth of color are, are three times more likely to be out of school than their counterparts. So the suspension data, not being able to have and know what that environment looks like within school districts is also a hindrance to targeting what resources we do have to addressing where the higher needs are at. Ellie? If I could just have a, um, since this was brought up by Perry uh, Stone Palmquist, mm -hmm. got that right. Um, what would it take to start tracking suspensions more, more meaningfully for uh, addressing uh, why districts are doing it and trying to come up with strategies to help them change? I don't know, I'll talk a little about the fields that are already there. Because there are current fields that deal with suspensions that, that are essentially voluntary for schools to submit data on. Right. Uh, the same information that we collect for special uh, students with an IEP uh, can be provided for students that don't have an active IEP, so general ed students. Um, that information uh, is already built into our system. In some cases, school districts already do report um, the same types of removal circumstances for their general ed population of students. Um, in our state, it is a matter of cost. Um, it is a, a burden on our districts to report information to the state. Um, that's been widely vetted in the, the legal arena for years. Um, it's currently about a $38 million proposition in our state to gather information. So um, if you look just at, by the numbers, uh, special ed's a fairly small percentage of our overall student population with 29,000 incidents of removal from a classroom environment. If you got into suspensions for general ed students, we would have to blow that up. Uh, by large um, numbers and gather excessively more data. So um, it's not a matter of the system being able to accomplish it, the systems we have at the state can. It's whether or not um, the policy and the political will um, encourages our districts to report that information. Thanks. Kathleen yeah, and then Cassandra. Following up Richard's question, uh, the first one is the Detroit Metro, Metro Prosperity <coughs> Then further down, there's one that's the Southeast Michigan Prosper Prosperity Region. And I always thought the Southeast Michigan Region was the Detroit area, Detroit Metropolitan Area. What's different? Um, sorry. Southeast. They're different figures. Yes, that is Region 9. Oh, my goodness, Kyle. That is I, I can't read that. <laughs> so that includes... Um, <laughs> includes... Uh, Jackson, Washtenaw, Lenaway, Monroe, and Hillsdale counties. So a different South definition East than we're used to. Yeah. That's yeah. Southeast Michigan? Not the yeah. usual definition. You wouldn't count that. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely different. We could send you the full yeah. map. There's yeah. a full sheet okay. map. It's a lot easier for people like me to read. They're a little optically challenged. Um, the one I have here today. Yeah. <laughs> was we'll shrunk. get to that map. <laughs> Oh, years ago, I worked at SEMCOG, the Southeast Michigan Council of Government. Right. That's mm -hmm. seven counties. Including the Detroit metropolitan area. Right. I, I, we'd have to uh, we'd have to ask the governor's office how those regions were identified, but um, okay. they certainly are mapped, and we can provide that to you. I guess it's not significant in this in this particular instance, but it's interesting. Um, I just I want to make sure that I'm reading this data correctly. So on this um, uh, with the green, mm -hmm. the percentages here are those percentages of students with an IEP who are chronically absent or is that the general population yeah, the only time the chronically a long time the IEP comes into to context is really um, well 
I would say they're probably represented in co the, the last column of data more strongly than other students. So that's a combination of students that have been expelled or have out of school suspensions. They've missed more than 10 days of school, basically. It could be but that's any that student, right? Any student. It's that's any general any population. They could be sick. They could have skipped. They right. could have been it's suspended, expelled. So on missed. a whole, roughly 30% of our students are missing more than 10 days. Yes. Mm -hmm. For some reason, yeah. Okay. That is accurate. And then of those, it's actually twice as frequent for a student that's had some type of disciplinary incident associated with them. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Tom. I do want to take the opportunity to thank you for the work you're doing with the department and, and with SEPI on reducing how school districts report <coughs> and, and reducing the amount of reports. That's good work, and I want to publicly thank you for that. Thank you. <coughs> All right, thank you for the presentation. The last item on the committee of whole agenda is a presentation on the Flint water re supply response. This presentation focuses on the response to the Flint water supply. It will focus on what is being done now and into the future to protect the children in Flint. It is not to look backwards at how the situation came to be. We want to work together to improve the situation as we move forward. We have Kyle Grant uh, presenting along with Dr. Eden Wells. Chief Medical Executive, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Wells, thank you for being here. Thank you for asking me to be here. I really appreciate having you all to talk, speak to and talk about some issues that are very much on the forefront, front burner uh, for, I know, the Department of Education, the board, you all, and I'd like to share some of the thoughts that we are having, at least from the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, I want to do a couple of background slides. We activated our emergency operations center last week. I know the Department of Education is represented in that operations center. And I wanted to share some baseline slides on just lead as a toxin so that we could all be on the same uh, base. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the health effects, uh, what we're doing at the provider level, uh, community level that uh, needs that are being done. And then a, a discussion, uh, just some thoughts that uh, have come up as to where we see the role of education is going to be paramount, and, but th those are my perspectives, and so you may have some other ideas and thoughts, and I'd greatly appreciate hearing them. So, you know, these slides, actually some of these come from our lead prevention program on a presentation I made for providers one week before I became uh, part or aware of the uh, Flint lead response. Uh, even at that time, lead poisoning remains the greatest environmental health hazard not just for Michigan, but across the country. And Michigan children under age six are our target population for intervention because they're the most at risk. Uh, just so you can see our 2014 data, the 2015 data should be coming out soon, is that nearly 3,000 children between the ages of zero and 16 were identified as lead poisoned in 2014. And I'll describe what that lead poison um, definition is in a little bit. What we do know is that the neurotoxicity or the damage to the neurologic system, particularly in the developing child, may be irreversible. So clearly primary prevention is always best, right? Never have a child exposed to lead in any possible way. So how are children poisoned? Well, uh, the, the mantra has been that the majority of the lead in our environment has been paint for the years that lead paint has been uh, coating our homes, particularly up until the 50s. Uh, when lead paint uh, or lead was taken out of lead paint. Remember, we had leaded gasoline. We had the choice, at least when I was growing up, for leaded paint and unleaded, or uh, gasoline and uh, unleaded gasoline. Um, but, you know, drinking water, uh, even beyond Flint, and we're learning a lot nationally by ex what we've experienced in Flint, drinking water uh, over the last decade has become uh, uh, where, even by all the, the water engineers that I've been talking with, as a uh, growing significance of potential sources of lead in drinking water across the country. And there's some very nice reports coming out of Montreal that uh, have been doing some studies of just uh, metropolitan uh, uh, drinking water sources and lead. So soil that's contaminated with paint or pollution or gasoline products over the centuries, you know, lead doesn't go away once it's in the environment very well, unless it's purposely cleaned. Uh, we do worry about parents who have particular hobbies or occupations that expose them to lead and then bring home. Even the dust can come off the, the, the um, clothing. And there is an active adult surveillance program in occupational um, medicine. The adult surveillance includes those people who work, and I'm going to talk about Flint here, with GM, who have a number of the jobs there, uh, are exposed to lead 
Those adults are tested regularly as well as part of their <coughs> occupational health program, but we have to remember that they go home to children, okay? And that there may be lead dust coming off of clothing or shoes or whatever there. And again, other uh, smaller but, but not uh, uh, insignificant uh, risks due to other hobbies or jewelry or folk remedies. So historically, as I've mentioned, we have always looked at uh, lead paint, or not, not just lead paint, but the majority of it being lead paint. Uh, up until this event, and again, aging house stock, uh, the infrastructures, particularly urban areas. You can imagine where I'm going here, old homes, old pipes, uh, where lead dust uh, may be particularly uh, evident. Uh, and as, of course, with young children who have a lot of hand-to-mouth behaviors, and lead has a sweet taste, lead paint particularly has a sweet taste to it, so it would not be uncommon for children to chew on things that have lead paint on them, or even window sills and such. Um, and again, as we look at the wa drinking water as a potential source, so we consider the whole population of Flint uh, as an exposed cohort, is the word I use, but a group, a population exposed since April of 2014 when the water was switched to a uh, different water source from Detroit. So the poisoning risk factors that we deal with, though, in this whole area of, you know, this is every city, every area of the state. So uh, I'm going to just think in general here, and then we'll focus back on the Flint. Is there anybody living in a home built before 1950 or in a home built before 1978 that's been remodeled? And that remodeling is because that actually left, it brings out the old, old paint dust. We have to remember also that if a child is identified as having an elevated blood lead level, siblings and playmates must also be investigated. And we also have to think about children, uh, if I go back into Flint here for a second, who may not live in the Flint city but attend schools within the city of Flint or play areas, child care centers, et cetera. So we have to be aware of uh, even, you know, not their home zip code at times, but where their schooling or daycare <coughs> zip code is at. And again, we talked about the adult hobbies. That would be fine. Okay. So the metabolism is where we'll go into talk, the importance of, of, of testing. You know, the main absorption is gastrointestinal, so we do worry about ingestion, whether it be water or paint or other contaminated toys. Um, and then the absorption rates are much higher in those of the developing child. And interestingly, it actually the nutritional state of the child and the hunger state of the child can actually accelerate the absorption. So if there's low levels of iron or calcium or vitamin C in the blood, or if the child's hungry for whatever reason, the body will actually preferentially pull lead from the environment into the blood of that child. And then that actually gets stored predominantly in bone. Uh, much of the blood lead level, which is the only thing we are able to test for because we can get a, a finger stick or, or do a venous <coughs> test, sticks around for about 28 days in the blood after a one-time exposure. The bone half-life is much longer, and we just have an x-ray here that shows you how we can actually see long-term. This would be heavy or chronic exposures over uh, uh, pro protracted periods of time. So acute symptoms, um, early clinical symptoms, and I will say, as we talk about children, we don't see this as much. I have actually seen this more. I took care of a, a patient who was a house painter who didn't wear his mask and, and got acute lead poisoning. Uh, but for a child coming in uh, or an adult, we'd be looking for unexplained anemia or a low blood cell count. Uh, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, decreased appetite. They, they have maybe abdominal pain or what we used to call lead colic. Uh, their stomach does not move well, and thus you also get a constipation because there's just not a good movement of the muscle. And the symptoms may also be, if it's an acute poisoning, we can actually have changes in mentation so that the children may be confused and such. That would be a pretty high level of, of uh, exposure and, and um, blood lead level. Uh, ataxia just means they're not walking regularly, seizures, coma, and death. Um, and so that is uh, very high levels. We have not experienced any of that here within uh, um, Michigan um, at all. Uh, but I'll talk about what we have seen. Known effects then are the anemia and the blood cells. Um, iron is required to obviously make good healthy blood cells. And if iron, if there's an iron deficiency, we get more lead absorption, which actually will um, start aggravating the iron deficiency anemia. So it's a vicious cycle. So anemia, especially in a child, is one, first, we want to know that it's there, but two, know that we need to remediate that because it'll actually promote more lead uptake. 
And if you don't have good iron, you're not going to get good new red blood cell production. So that's all really this. Uh, so showing the microscope, just showing how the red blood cells could look like under a microscope uh, if we see lead effects. Um, the neurologic system is really why I think the Department of Ed is going to be involved with us, uh, I know, over, over some time. We do know, uh, and studies have shown, that even uh, fairly low levels of blood lead uh, over periods of time can affect um, early development. Remember that the prime time for development for children, especially between the year of, or the age of one, sorry, zero days and one year, the infant age is very critical. That's when the developmental uh, neurologic um, rate is very, very high. But even from ages zero, zero to six years, that's still quite high and quite rapid. So all of this can be uh, uh, impacted in ultimately perhaps by teenage years or early, early adolescence or a little later. You may be seeing changes in behavioral uh, uh, <coughs> displays. There may be learning disorders. Attention uh, deficit disorders have been seen and the reduction <coughs> in IQ. And you know, I, I work quite a bit with Dr. Monahan Atisha. You may all be familiar with her. She was the pediatrician who originally showed the results of the elevated blood lead lead from Hurley Hospital. But we talk about this sort of, it just decreases that IQ curve and flattens it, maybe by a couple points. But if you have a child that's at one end of the spectrum, the low end, that could be extremely significant. And what would that mean? I don't know how many children that means, but this could be an impact. And again, we talked about those outcomes could be issues of uh, what you were just talking about before my, my presentation, uh, juvenile delinquency or elevated uh, dropout rates, uh, potential links to criminal behavior. We do have a lot of unknowns here, and so we'll have to be working together um, hand in hand as we try to interpret the data as we receive it and, and, and know as much as we need to know. But right now, I can't tell you how much lead each child in Flint was exposed to. We also don't know how much exposure from the water or other sources in the environment have contributed to the blood lead level if they have an elevated one at this time. We don't know who or how many are going to exhibit the long-term effects. Not everybody who, who ingests water lead or anything will ultimately have a uh, behavioral or uh, cognitive deficit. But we do know that children at risk for such events, high stress households, poor nutrition, stress in the environment, other toxicologic issues, and then you add lead on top of that could definitely aggravate the situation. Lead is one more bad stick on the camel's back, if that is, is a good way to put it. Um, and then, uh, well, I think we'll go on and if I'll, I'll answer questions if need be. So our right now is our request, and, and we have been firing this out to all the providers uh, within Flint City, because the counties, it's not so much a county issue as this Flint City that actually switched over on the water is that we want all children tested less than six years of age if they've not had a test since April 2014. Now, a child who tests zero today, if I test that child zero today, is not going to necessarily tell me that they weren't exposed in the last year and a half, right? Because I've already told you that it could be 28 days after they last were exposed. But I also know that the water is still a source, as well as the ongoing environmental issues. We know that, okay? But let's talk water. and that when we do case investigations, we're still having stories of families that may not still have access to uh, filters, even though they're be distributed free and they're there. We've got to get more out. <coughs> and they may not be attaching the filters correctly. And there is some truth to the fact that many people, get, uh, I know I got one and I still haven't figured it out, but the spray type faucets that have a nozzle, you can switch the, the that is, that's a hard, the filters don't attach well to those spray faucet type. So there are some issues here that if they're not using the filters that they need to be using bottled water. And our tests will identify the cohort that currently has elevated blood lead levels. We want every child tested under six. That's great because then they be, they, then they can be looked up, talked to, counseled about getting lead out of their environment. But we're going to still assume that the whole cohort of the population exposed since April of 2014, regardless of their blood lead level, is exposed. Is that, okay. And we, I can answer questions on that further. So um, some testing guidance at this point. In 2012, uh, the CDC, no, beginning, you know, again, learning more about even how low levels of lead may actually affect childhood development is uh, the 10 micrograms per deciliter used to be our cutoff or action level for public health uh, intervention. 
Now that has decreased in 2012 to five micrograms per deciliter. So you can see the guidance that's provided to our providers here. Uh, we want to screen all children with risk factors. Every child in Flint is considered absolutely to be screened. And this is beyond and above the Medicaid recommendations for the usual one and two-year-old screening. If a child, uh, um, most, of our, most of our results actually in the last, uh, we've, been, we've been on this since October 1st, most, uh, and we've been testing for years, don't get me wrong, but the rapid or the comprehensive response since October 1st, most of those have been within the 5 to 15 range of uh, findings. So you can see that fits in the two columns here, blood lead level less, uh, um, less than 5 and then 5 to 14. A few have been greater than 15. We've only had one case that was greater than 44. Um, per that recommendation, all children who test in that level, and they may not have symptoms, but they might, they are immediately sent by the provider to Children's Hospital in Detroit, where they receive the help of the toxicologists that uh, also staff our really, really good <coughs> poison control center. So Cynthia Aaron is our lead toxicologist there, and she would determine if the child needs treated. In this one case, by the time the child actually who had sent there immediately, that test came back as actually in the 30s and ultimately was able to be discharged home without needing treatment, which is great. But still, um, that gives the perspective here that, that this, is a, um, this is a good guideline for providers to hold to, and this has been disseminated. This is actually something that all pediatricians are per, very well acquainted with. Most family practitioners, anybody who takes care of children should be familiar with that graph long before even the Flint response. I, uh, uh, I, as I tell Mona, I said, Mona, if you've got these great slides, I'm, I'm borrowing them from you because uh, she and I have talked at length about what is needed for this response. And you all are probably familiar with this curve. But, you know, there's so many things that we can do to, for, again, to cocoon this child, to give them the best um, environment to mitigate any potential effects from the lead exposure that they've had. And also to understand that there's also this idea that there's multiple stressors perhaps within that child's envir environment <coughs> in addition to lead. So can we maximize everything in order to mitigate good uh, any lead on neurological or cognitive or social development? So again, the experiences, the parenting, the education, the primary health care, the good nutrition and the safe environments, all of that really has to be brought to play in this situation, like it should everywhere, but I think this really prompts the, the response. Nutrition, I, I think this is just important for you all to be aware. It's, it's really uh, a right on, it's a primary preventive tool, uh, but uh, one that really needs to be addressed uh, in this population. So we're really working on, you know, there's the diets, and I've actually put a little thing to the side if you want to see what particular calcium and iron and vitamin C can do, but they basically interfere with lead being absorbed into the body. So it's really good to have a good nutritious diet. And I know that the uh, Department of Ed works very closely with agriculture and USDA to get these things to happen, but that's going to be important. Promoting more enrollment. We know that not everybody eligible for WIC is enrolled at this point. We, we try, we're trying, you know, maximally get these folks the resources they actually do qualify for. So uh, double up food bucks, et cetera. And then WIC, 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 as much as we can. Okay? So here comes the education part, and this is where I'm really, I'll, I'll throw out some points, but then I'd be more interested in your input. Um, quality child care options and really subsidizing those that work, uh, evidence-based, and licensed. Early on, automatic referral and assessment. So that, you know, this is a, a, a defining uh, condition to be lead exposed, so we want to make sure that everybody's getting enrolled as needed. To uh, enroll in the early, early Head Start and Head Start programs as uh, available, and of course, uh, making universal the preschool and Flint pre-promise uh, type programs. Uh, special education capacity, that means a lot. We've got to have trained personnel, perhaps more on the ground. What does that mean? How many would that actually entail? Those are some things that I think are up for discussion. Um, and, and all, oh, by the way, this was the same slides. I, just so you all know, these were presented by Dr. Monahan Atisha to the Governor's <coughs> Task Force. So there is actually <coughs> some pertinence that I'm actually sharing you, uh, with, with you these today, too, because we work all <coughs> this along with the Governor's Task Force recommendations on how we would like to see the response be. But again, your input is vital. Investing in school health and wellness, uh, behavioral health. So that might mean that nurse-student ratio where, you know, we struggle with uh, all the time. Model led safe school campaigns. The schools were outstanding. I must say, I have the what a partner the city of Flint superintendent has been. 
uh, children were immediately bringing home information to their parents. That's just one of many strategic ways. They've had a lot of affairs with our local health department and getting uh, um, good uh, information and even testing capability there. Uh, um, he has been absolutely outstanding. Uh, school nutrition, obviously, we've talked about this. And then, you know, there's even be, you know, is there more human services uh, capability that need to be placed? Perhaps, you know, I put this as a question mark at every school, but that's something we're thinking about at our department as well. Um, oh, okay, that's it. Well, I wanted to, that's a brief, because I thought you may have more questions, or also I'd be really interested in your input. Um, so, but I just wanted to give you that baseline. There is a lot of discussion to be had, I know. Uh, and I know that the, the governor's uh, interagency group is already beginning to tackle some of these questions. John, and then Eileen. Dr. Wells, thank you for coming. Um, and I, like everyone here, is I hope you know, most interested in what do we do to solve problems and to help these real kids who are <coughs> poisoned. Um, but listening to the presentation, um, and it may be, I don't want to sort of um, beat the messenger, but mm -hmm. I, you're calling now for a bunch of new investments, uh, important things. I would remind us that the way we got to this point was a some years where we as a state basically chose austerity over investments which led to defunding municipalities for things like water infrastructure defunding public health services defunding our schools certainly and uh, less environmental enforcement mm -hmm. uh, and then when you combine that with emergency managers whose incentives are to cut costs versus rebuild community you get this horrible perfect storm that is hurt the lives of, of real school kids. And, you know, I guess A, and it's maybe not fair to Karen either, but I mean, is the governor and team willing to make the case for these types of investments in Flint or in every community, the things at the end of your presentation? Are we really gonna do that? And or what kind of, and I'll defer to Pam, what kind of now specialized services do these kids and their families need to cope with all the negative consequences that you described from the lead treatment that they've already gotten? Uh, all those behaviors that are going to emerge. Are we really willing to do that? What do we as a state board need to insist upon that we help make happen? So does that mean I get to go now? Uh, well, I'll I have Eileen next, and then I'll have Pam. Yeah, uh, you know, and I, uh, what I would do is I'll just step and say, I can't speak for the governor. I can only speak for my role with the department. And I know that we are going through each of these trying to figure out how any of these can be implemented. And, and we should we, we are doing that in an interagency fashion as to how that all gets done. Um, I'm sure they're working on that, but not in my office. Okay. Oh, we, oh I'm sorry, Jeff. Just, I mean, yeah. these are all invest in school health, um, school nurse ratios, nutrition. You know, these, it's not just Flint that's affected. Right. So are we, are we saying now we're going to do these specially for Flint? Um, but I'm more concerned with, we've got kids who are poisoned, and what are we doing for those school kids and their families tomorrow? And what, what aren't we yet figuring out how to do that we need to be supportive of how we figure out how to do, too? All right. Uh, we had Eileen and then Pam. Um, and then do, Kathleen. Do you know yet how many children were exposed? Um, so we have a denominator of, of, uh, of <coughs> under six years old of close to eight to 9,000 children. I don't have the exact number in front of me. I'm sorry about that. That's we okay. got that. We definitely are, have that tracked, and we are uh, testing these children, as, as, as you know, as quickly as possible. Uh, we, we best want these children, by the way, tested at their primary care homes because that's where the doctor can use, you know, are they anemic? Are they getting adequate nutrition and look at the child holistically? But um, so that number of children under six is the number that we're looking at as needing to be, you know, the, the cohort that we'd be wanting to follow over a long period of time. Yes. So I'm looking at something that I can't imagine is possible, but I'm hopeful that it is. Mm -hmm. With just hearing that doctors are going into homes is huge because what you're having to look at is a holistic wrap. I've also cleaned up a scrapyard, and I know that non-detect is not necessarily the same as uh, significant damage. Mm -hmm. What worries me for these families, obviously this is a horrible situation, mm -hmm. and those parents are going to be living, biting their fingernails until their kid is through you know, high school or beyond. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, but I also know that, um, uh, and there's very little mitigation possible. Chelation therapy only takes care of extreme yeah. physical issues, but nothing is known right now to help neurological toxicity. Mm -hmm. But, but I also wonder what hope can be extended to these families because, as you said, individual uptake is completely different from exposure. 
and um, the you know it'd be great if we had no children at all. I, I was looking at the Hurley presentation. Mm -hmm. um, the <coughs> kids in Flint uh, under five years of age who were tested by Hurley, but this was a very small sample. Mm -hmm. uh, it was only about 700 kids relative to just yes, about one yeah. tenth. Mm -hmm. Had about two and a half times um, uh, increase in levels, but we don't know for sure if that's the highest level they absorbed. And we also don't know if that's going to really damage them. We know that 10 shows significant uh, starts to a damage. Is there hope for these parents? I mean, I, I'm listening to all of this, and I, everything I read in the paper, if I were one of these parents, I'd curl up and, and, and never come out of my ball. I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I worry about how they're going to put their feet forward. I think that's one of the things. Uh, I was having this exact same discussion with Dr. Hanna Atisha and then uh, a little bit couple weeks ago with Dr. Reynolds who runs the Mott Clinic there. Uh, one point of clarification, we'd like the children to go to their their uh, primary care provider, which is what we call their patient-centered home, so the doctor's not going to the home. Okay, okay I'm sorry, but, but is yeah. there, there, are but, people doing home visits? Yes, for these and there's a lot of door-to-door, -door -door, yeah, in fact that, unfortunately, I think there was a contingent going out today doing some deliveries, and it sounds like Flint got pretty uh, bad weather. So that's been limited a bit today, what they're able to do. But that is the, and, and to maximize those efforts with door-to-door -door efforts and education and assessments. Every child who has an elevated blood level of five or greater is connected up with a case manager and a case manager even with their health plan, but also a case manager within the health department. And they have essentially a educational opportunity, going home, talking to the family. And they could, this is an, what we call EBL or elevated blood level investigation. This is where actually specialists will go in and look for potential sources in the environment that may be currently impacting that child, including water testing, which was not part of those investigations up until the Flint issues, obviously, that we were dealing with. Um, you talk about, though, the reassurance that's needed, and that's where I think also the Board of Education can greatly help us and the Department of Education in the sense that we, you know, and, and uh, I've talked to cohorts at CDC along with our, my fellow pedi pedi pediatrician uh, colleagues, we don't know what those outcomes are. And not everyone, obviously, who's been exposed is going to end up being compromised in ways. We do know that children that are at higher risk, they carry the toxic stress, let's say, of other uh, issues nutritionally, emotionally, parentally, economically, I can keep going, right? And, and all of that can actually aggravate the, the effect that lead would have. Um, but that is currently something that I'm unable to quantitate, but that's the type of thing in the interagency coordination and using the subject matter experts that we want to get a handle on. We can get people to model that, but that's not real people, you know, so that's very important. So there's got to be good information on to getting that realistic, you know, who is going to be affected, who not. A lot of that may be having those supports in place for parental support, but also for the early testing and developmental testing that goes on. Thanks. All right, I have a list of everyone, but the next up is Pam Pugh and then Kathleen Strauss. Thank you for coming. And um, so I've had the opportunity for many years to work with the folks at the department. Um, to really see drastic reductions in elevated blood levels. So this is uh, an awful um, place that we're at. So it sounds like um, there have not been any children who have had to be chelated right. then. Okay, so the one child did not have to no, be. No, um, evaluated, kept in the hospital for a day or two, I believe, and then discharged home. Okay. And so, and, and then. I might I'll add that the investigation showed that that was not a water source. Okay. Just, I'm not trying to minimize that, but there was an investigation with a significant lead ingestion due to some paint issues. Okay. Because once the child is chelated, if there were any children that we do find at those levels, we can't send them back into those environments because exactly. that's going to be a, a lot of quicker uptake. Okay. So then the other question, and it sounds like um, EBL guidance, I actually helped to write that the first one. I don't know if it's changed, but it does mm -hmm. sound like you've added this additional step of, of water yes. to that. Mm -hmm. um, and then it we've talked about the dysregulation of the immune system um, just by the sheer nature of the children that we're talking about but we've also looked at research that shows that lead can also cause those effects um, I, I participated in research or letter research study that looked at asthma and lead and showed the comorbidity of the two so right. um, just you know thinking about that as well 
Um, and while we're on the talk of the impacts, um, I'm forgetting the professor's name in Pittsburgh that did the study that looked at the lead years later that leached from the bone structure. Well, it, it was, um, I, I there I was exactly some correlation. Doing, I don't know the name. Yeah. And so looking at years after a child has been lead poisoned in their adult life, looking at the correlation between delinquent behavior, these, these people I believe were in the penal system mm -hmm. and looking at their lead levels and they were much more likely to have been lead poisoned um, and landed in the, in the penal system. Um, and good to hear um, that we're bringing these links together because we've talked about this with the L Lieutenant Governor's work group as we're talking about special education. We've also have to, you know, look forward possibly to um, this being a part of that, that work, these children landing and their parents landing in that, that area. Um, as there was another, you talked about the lead safe school campaigns, there is a work group w with the University of Michigan mm -hmm. um, that's working on a policy around healthy schools and this has been ongoing for some time and that's under the direction of Paul mm -hmm. Mohai. Um, also, um, I, I also want to mention too, as we talk about this interagency working group, mm -hmm. um, one of the things, and Karen, you might be able to remind the governor of this, is that uh, for about six years, we worked on an environmental justice uh, plan mm -hmm. under the DEQ um, when Steve Chester was the director and then we also had a um, that turned into an mm -hmm. environmental justice directive we asked for this as part of that directive um, this group came up with the inner um, working interagency working group mm -hmm. because it doesn't need to just be here you know we're talking about in Detroit where teachers are in unsafe or students are in unsafe learning environments teachers are pointing that out mm -hmm. and so uh, you know we don't need to piecemeal this this is something that we need to be looking at um, for various environmental right. um, exposures um, speaking of various environmental exposures this issue around the water did not just start with the lead there was taste smell uh, issues that we had so are we looking at some of these other factors that um, are known to be in the water that these um, uh, that parents and children have been exposed to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you can answer that okay. question later. Right. And then um, <laughs> also <laughs> <I'll keep> <laughs> <track>. <laughs> under the age of six, typically I always thought that we really looked at the age of six because of the hand to mouth mm -hmm. um, exposure that we were typically looking for. We're looking at the oh, lead definitely. dust. So why aren't we looking at older children mm -hmm. um, and parents? Um, are we missing out um, looking at the half-life of lead? Um, are we missing out mm -hmm. um, on where this exposure is coming from? Testing locations, we as a board looked at uh, schools as a site of testing location. I know that that's, a, you know, that's huge for um, the workforce, but one of the things that we learned um, is that when you give parents a slip to go get tested, a million things come up yes. and they don't get tested. Um, around this issue of making sure that children are, um, have the, the proper nutrition to block the lead from, from binding, Flint is a food desert. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as far as, uh, you know, how are we uh, making sure that the children get the food? Are we able to put fruits and vegetables in backpacks? Is mm -hmm. the um, farmers market able to to expand um, you're f probably familiar with health and all policies and Brian it's good to see that you're on this interagency work group uh, you know that's something that moving forward we probably want to be talking about um, as a department have we looked at school count data because these schools are going to be held accountable and that's a point that I brought up a few meetings ago to students, you know, not showing up and, you know, the funding issues that, that come with that. Uh, we see it with our businesses, but we better be looking at it with our schools as well and taking that into consideration that that may be um, why they're showing up um, on the Department of Technology Man Management and Budgets list of schools. Um, one of the other issues, um, United Parents Against Lead, that was, uh, mm -hmm. as, as Eileen was talking, um, I think it was Margaret Souser some years ago, her child, there was a parent 
um, and she was a huge advocate for parents mm -hmm. around this issue of lead poisoning and giving them hope, talking mm -hmm. about the extra miles that she had to take to make sure that her child had the necessary tools so that the imp lead did not impact him right. in, in as negative a way as possible. I think that those are ways to, to restore hope. Um, so those are some of the things. Of course, I have issues uh, that we can get into later as far as the same emergency manager yeah. that's, that we're dealing with in Detroit, and we'll probably have that discussion. Maybe I'll bring it up there mm -hmm. since Brian told us to move forward. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like wait. that. <laughs> wait. It's coming, though. All so, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's, I, I heard a couple questions, and so uh, I can answer ones I'll best look at. But, you know, first off, looking at other potential sources in the water, um, you know, one of the things we're monitoring closely is the phosphate levels that are put in to help control the, the corrosivity or help improve the or decrease the corrosivity of the pipes as we know that were damaged from the corrosiveness uh, early on. And those levels, even with the increased phosphates they've used, uh, there's a huge margin or, of, um, or window that we have towards uh, any kind of uh, toxicity towards infants and children at this point. There's always testing that goes on both at the city and DEQ for other elements. You know, one of the things that I always uh, have concerns about and which led to the original, um, you know, the, that funny color, the funny smell, mm -hmm. that was followed by actually a boil water alert because there was concerns about bacteria in the water and things. So that's always important to look for uh, line breaks that might be consistent with bacteria then being able to seep into the water system. Um, and uh, other chemicals that I know of, I've not been made aware of any, and at this point, uh, oh, but I will say after the boil water, then there was the um, THMs or the, that really caused the rashes. So this was a byproduct of the um, uh, chlorinating agents that they put in to try to deal with the bacteria in the water. You can see this population has dealt with very, you know, these different episodes in the water and you can imagine, you know, boil water. Well, that's the worst thing you can do, by the way, for right. lead in water, right? Then you have chlorine and then there was the rashes due to that and then the lead. So you can imagine a series of events that has led to a lot of confusion um, and a lot of concern and and suspicion about water right well the trihalomethanes are used to disinfect because you find high levels of coliform which right. could also indicate that there's fecal matter in that's the water. exactly so, right so i when mean we're are doing we the bacteria at, well, you have a very good point and she's so what we're looking for the particular type of bacteria is coliform because it's a uh, based on the term E. coli, which makes up the predominant amount of our, our stool. And so if you're seeing that in drinking water, that means there's been a septic um, um, break brown water. somewhere. And <laughs> it's brown water. Yeah. yeah. So um, so all of that, yes. And, and I can say that I don't do the testing. I'm not a water expert, but I do rely on those tests that, that I would say, you know, is the water safe to bathe in? Is it safe to drink? No. Is it safe to cook with? Well, we don't want you to because that can concentrate uh, things such metals. as heavy metals like lead. Mm -hmm. um, but can you bathe in it? Yes. Uh, things that they should know, and we have all these materials, you know, don't wash your fruits and vegetables with unfiltered or um, uh, tap water. Uh, use, and by the way, I know there's been an emphasis on bottled water. Do know that those filters do work, and we're using the National Sanitation Foundation uh, approved. I, there's been a number of people request they want to donate filters from their companies, but they're not NSF approved. We want the ultimate filter that's going to screen not only lead, but copper and all the other heavy metals that may be in it. Um, Half-life. As I mentioned to you, the only way we can test for blood normally is first through a capillary, which is a finger poke on these poor little kiddos, and then if that comes back elevated, there's a confirmatory venous draw, which is even a little harder for the little tykes, but, but that's what's needed to confirm that. And um, for blood lead levels, that half-life is 28 days, and that's why I, if I had a child that's zero right now, that still doesn't tell me they weren't exposed right. for a day, a month, a year, since, you know, whatever period of time since April 2014. So that's important. Um, let me read. Um, uh, hand to mouth behaviors, yes, but also this is at the time where there's the hand to mouth, but also the neurologic development, which is so key. You are very right, and thank you for bringing up the point on the <coughs> immunologic. I, you know, <coughs> lead as a toxin is a full <coughs> body system toxin. It, there is not an organ in the body it doesn't affect, right? And it is stored primarily in our soft tissues and in our bone. 
uh, but we can only measure it in the blood. So that's why you bring up a very interesting point. A study in Pittsburgh shows that if you're in a time of stress as an adult, and maybe you're exposed as a child, and most of that lead is in your bone, uh, that's where children put a lot of it in, is bone, that stress, maybe it's a disease, maybe it's being incarcerated, maybe it's immune system breakdown somewhere, or your body's deficient, that bone will release some lead back into the blood. Okay? And that was some of the studies we've learned is that this is, this is something that we pregnant always women. need to be aware of. Yes, and pregnancy is an absolute aggravator. All right, so we got Kathleen and then Richard. Well, I got you. this has been really very informative and helpful and to understand all of this. Or to, maybe we don't understand all of it, but to get exposed to it. Uh, Pam brought up some of the things that I was, she, she brought up a lot more than I would have thought of even, but some of the things uh, that, that concerned me was your potential responses mm -hmm. uh, are, I think are, are really critical. We, the, the subsidizing quality childcare options, we don't have enough of them. Yeah. And how, you know, I, we're focusing on Flint, but this applies in Detroit for sure. It applies everywhere in the state. I, I said I worked at SEMCOG years ago, 40 years ago maybe. We were, we were talking about lead, lead poisoning and the dangers to children and trying to do something about it. That was 40 years ago, and we're still trying to do something about it. Some of these things really scare the devil out of me. I wonder, how does it take so long for us to deal with these issues? Anyway, we have to do more to focus this as a statewide problem. I don't suppose you could say there's a silver lining to this, but every cloud is supposed to have a silver lining. It is a, it's focusing on the dangers of lead poisoning around the state, right. Right. not just in Flint, which is is really desperate, but mm -hmm. it's probably pretty bad and still in Detroit. Well, there were reports a couple of years ago about Detroit, mm -hmm. so that's that's one thing. The whole business about early early childhood, I think, is critical because we've been focusing on early childhood as being critical to mm -hmm. success in school anyway, and this makes it even more more critical, and the birth to birth to five, mm -hmm. that's another area that, that even be birth to three, I mean, we're talking about getting maybe universal uh, child care for four-year-olds, mm -hmm. you really need them, need it for three-year-olds, you need the treatment or the, the attention from birth. And I think some of the things that we're talking about are the top 10 kind of thing are, are included in here, I think. Where some of these things are will be included in the top ten. The early enroll in early Head Start and Head Start. It's really these are some of the things we've been talking about in our early childhood. It's really critical. But the, the point that uh, the, the Pam made about future needs in special ed, mm -hmm. that's what a that's a real concern and we should be preparing for more children in special ed, which is really scary. So, can I make a couple comments? Uh, because I think it's striking. One, one point you make up that you're absolutely right. Lead has been noticed as a toxin for centuries, right? Yeah. But what we do know is since public health efforts to mitigate lead since the 1950s or to remove it from as many environmental sources as we could, um, we can see in graphs or looking at the proportion of children uh, with elevated blood lead levels has dropped in the last 40 years and there's been a wonderful decline. And even if you look at the state of Michigan um, over the last five years, and we have this data up on our, our website by the way, our interagency website is michigan.gov forward slash Flint water. And you can see our reports, but you can see over the last five years in general in Michigan <coughs> and in Flint. The proportion of our children having elevated <coughs> blood levels has come down. Well, and the exception was when there was this uptick right in the third quarter, you know, in the summer months when everybody's outside and playing in the soil. Uh, it went up uh, again in, in 2014 in Flint, but not in Genesee County, right? So public health mitigation efforts have worked. And the CDC, well, you know, none of this has ever been greatly funded, you know, ever. But these efforts have worked. And a lot of what you all have all done, you know, the, 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 the programs and the things that have been in place for healthy schools and such have worked. So that's hope. There is some silver lining here is what 
here's my vision and I am not, I am, I'm not appointed and I'm not, okay, so I just want to say, here's my vision if I take a look at what the silver linings are. I worked with a pandemic influenza, that's how I know Kyle very well. We worked on a statewide initiative to prepare the state for a severe pandemic. There still could be one, there wasn't one then. But the point about that is that the silver lining was, is we were funded to respond as a state for one infectious disease that could be very, very serious, don't get me wrong. But with that, we could build up an infrastructure for preparedness across the whole state that is still in place today. With this, we may focus initially some issues in Flint, but the idea is this isn't. You know, it, we have to think continually that lead is throughout our state, <coughs> just like it's throughout the country. Many people, I will assure you, many people from the Department of Health and Human Services, our senators and congressmen uh, who I've been on the phone with, the EPA, uh, all these national folks, state governments around the country are looking to Flint and they're looking to us because we are informing them what perhaps every state should be doing. And there's a silver lining there because if we can model a great response in Flint and make that a trip, uh, as applicable to all of our high-risk areas, the Battle Creeks, the Grand Rapids, the Detroits, you can name them, we will become, uh, Mona and Hannah, Atisha and I talk about this, can we become a model public health and educational um, area that can really be a model for the rest of the country? There's, there's, there's a vision that I speak to you on January 12th. I, I can only hope. Oh. All right, we have, we have Richard, then Michelle, and then uh, ending with Cassandra. Richard? Yeah, a, a couple of I, maybe technical questions. How do the filters work? I mean, do they, they don't physically filter out particles. They must chemically absorb or something. How do the, how do the filters work? What is their expected life? Good question. So not the toxicologist. My understanding is actually they do have the ability to filter out solids. Okay. And by virtue of that, though, that means they do have a life cycle, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so that uh, these are National Science Foundation certified. Um, most that we we're using, um, I think it's just been one general brand here, but it has an alert that will turn red uh, to the homeowner. Uh, when that filter needs to be changed. And we actually, when we got the supplemental funding, understood that not only do you have to fund a first um, distribution of filters, you need to plan for that second, which is usually in about two months with normal use of water. And my toxicologist could tell you how much water could be run through a filter with what temperature, over what period of time, how long that filter would last. Um, they're not my toxicologist, but I work with them. Right, right. Um, but the point being is that the more water you run through, that will accelerate the um, life cycle. It'll shorten the life cycle. Well, is, is it a chemical reaction that that makes the lead adhere to something in the filter? That's not. I, I couldn't tell you that for sure. My under, my understanding was actually a physical property. Okay. Um, to that, that it was actually um, not something. It doesn't draw things out of solution. Okay. My, so, but I can, what I will do is I've gotten your name is I can get you information if I am wrong, but my understanding was that this had to, these are highly, highly uh, micrometized filters that would block actually that. There's probably something ionic on them though, because I do know, uh, ionic meaning that sort of the chemical charge, because I do know that for certain filters are rated for certain chemicals <coughs> in different ways. Yeah. So there's a science there that I do defer to my toxicologist for. And then the other question I had is, what, what are there any implications to using this leaded water for laundry? <coughs> I mean, do you end up with a lead residue with clothes or, or, or you know, the physical rubbing uh, against it? Is that, or is the, or the quantity so microscopic that that's not a, con not a concern? So laundry, yeah, I'm not aware of anything with that, that that's probably pretty small. We're probably more worried about the dust uh, from, uh, for instance, somebody who's working at the factory and coming home at the end of the day. Uh, uh, or uh, what's in the environment already, like the soil and such. But again, also with water uh, being what we're really here for today, uh, that is not my understanding that that is a significant source. Um, uh, so that's good, but that said, I will follow up on that as well. But I, always, I always like to, the toxicologists are kind of tied at my hip. You can't see them, <laughs> they're there. Okay. All right, Michelle and Cassandra, please. Um, my questions are, um, related to um, resources for abatement. Mm -hmm. um, 
so not just in responding, but so you, you say it's um, these issues with lead are throughout mm -hmm. geographically, and and I also have a question: Is it more than lead? I've, I've heard reports about arsenic and mercury and all kinds of heavy metal poisoning issues, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know one of my kids was diagnosed with heavy metal poisoning, mm -hmm. what which is also some people call him autistic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it, he, he went through the chelation, which reduced those levels down, okay. but the damage was done. And I don't know the source of why and why him, mm -hmm. but I, it, 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 um, so my question is um, also related to um, potential for, for that affecting other children similarly. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so in, in a more, in a, so other chemicals, geographic area, but what is what is the plans for abatement? What are the what is the policies to stop another flint from happening again? And I know, and I you know I recognize what um, uh, what John has said about you know our financial restrictions and the defunding that you know that we're putting tax breaks above all else, um, mm -hmm. in, in what it's doing to our state. Mm -hmm. um, so I know there's not a whole lot of money. So I want I want your response to that, and but I also just one last thing because I, with Kyle's report from before about absenteeism, and uh, and then I'm also thinking about what Pam said about the the, the benefits of, like for for the SNAP you know they're using mm -hmm. absenteeism as a, as a mechanism to cut off mm -hmm. benefits mm -hmm. to provide nutrition, <laughs> and that <laughs> that would be something the department would please rethink and the legislature would please rethink. Mm -hmm. um, because it seems to be like uh, counter to everything that I'm hearing today. So anyway, <coughs> so I, I'd like to know the, your, the plans for abating in other areas. Okay, so a couple things and, and uh, that I'm aware of, but maybe not expert on, because it goes a little bit out of my, my knowledge field. One, in terms of other chemicals, I'm not aware. I know that the city and the DEQ and everybody do these tests, and then they yeah. report. I'm not aware of any other heavy metal at this okay. point. And uh, I, would, I would think that there is, there is a lot of people looking at water tests, you know, including our EPA colleagues. And there's a task force, a special task force assigned from EPA actually working with the city and such on testing. Um, abatement. So there is a, a HUD, uh, Housing and Urban Development, funding that helps with what we call our Healthy Homes Initiative here at the Department of Health and Human Services. Now, so let's say that a child... Um, case manager talks to the family and there is a remediable uh, oh and then there's an investigation and they said well you know there's lead paint in this house or maybe it's the water whatever the source may be um, then what can happen is the uh, healthy homes folks can come in and and this, that family can actually enroll in a lead abatement program most of that's funded for lead paint we're trying to work with that as a policy issue on our and with the department and with HUD because we have to realize that water may be a source and not lead paint Right. So that's one policy initiative we're looking at. Um, families do have to sign up for that particular lead abatement program. They obviously have to be of a certain income and then have paid taxes, which, um, you know, that might be limiting. So there's some policy issues I know that the department we're looking at there. Um, issues of other abatement, lead pipes. Those ty that goes, a that's a bit out of my, that's more in the Department of Environmental Quality and with EPA. But I know that that's part of what's being discussed as uh, long-term needs in terms of uh, lead. Uh, Washington, D.C. has done this, and I know New York has done some of this, is, and Lansing actually had pipes uh, replaced uh, not, a, uh, <coughs> not long back, somewhere in the last decade. Uh, so there has to be funding for a lead pipe um, <coughs> replacement program. And this also, that's the main lines, but then there's service lines to each home, who's responsible for them, <coughs> et cetera, et cetera. So all of those things are on the table, but I don't, I can't speak to what those policies are going to look like. But that's where all that interagency work is going together at the request of the governor, because those things will, may go up further to the federal level. Thank you, Michelle. Cassandra, please. Um, well, as the last speaker, let me just reiterate how much we appreciate you coming out here today and <coughs> taking the time to answer all these questions. And um, it, it's certainly eye-opening um, and um, knowledgeable, uh, or helps me understand more of what happened. I, 
I want to talk a little bit more specifically about the schools mm -hmm. themselves. Um, you laid out some, some great options here, which are long-term options. Unfortunately, uh, what ha happens in crises is once the sense of urgency goes away, so do the long-term remedies. And so my question is more focused on the short term. Um, how many schools have been tested? Um, how many have been affected? And what has been done to mitigate um, the ongoing exposure to kids in those schools? Good questions. So again, probably uh, I'm going to tell you what I know, but then I'm going to refer you to the school testing results that are posted on the michigan.gov forward slash Flint Water site because the DEQ is posting those school testing results. I do know that the first priority were the 13 schools within the Flint City public system, and those have all been tested. There have been, um, uh, from what I understand, some positives in each of the, and not every one of them, but a couple of the schools, and those seem to be coming down to the faucet areas, the, uh, I'm not going to have the right word, the um, um, the aerators and such, yeah, and, and these items where the, the particulates may be getting stuck, so, uh, which is a little reassuring, so it's not like a major service line, it's when uh, there's actually at the items that are at the faucet level, uh, where these sources are being found. So they're not being found up the pipe, which is my understanding. Is, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but how is that possible? How can you have participant or part particles at the source but not coming in through the line? Well, the testing is done from the, the point where the water comes out and then is moved back. Okay. Some of that is probably due to when you have a corrosive area in the pipe that, that biofilm breaks off, and I'm so horrible because okay. I know a DEQ person could do this far better. But when the biofilm breaks off, it can flick off and fly up and then get caught in the faucet material oh, okay. so it doesn't get stuck in the pipe itself. Okay. And so that, but they have a particular testing algorithm. <coughs> I would ask Kyle to perhaps bring maybe a specialist who could tell you more about it. But um, so that way they can actually find what area in the mechanism from the main line out on the street all the way through the many, many pipes that serve the school. And then they're able to say, okay, we think it's, oh, fixtures was the word I was coming with. Uh, the bubblers in um, some of the water fountains have I know have been identified. Uh, there was one area where I know there's some faucets and there was, I think, in a school nursing area, you know, so there are definite places that need to be remediated in each school, but it wasn't as though you had to go and dig up all the school pipes, which has been great. Uh, that, that's the good news with the caveat that there has to be remediation of these faucets and such before, you know, things could be back to normal. So if right I now... Just time to yeah. to that piece. In those 13 schools, the water fountains themselves have been shut off. So yeah. the, the schools good. and students in school are drinking bottled water only right. while they're in school. And the Department of Agriculture is assisting us with making sure, and the local health department has been great about this too, you know, what kind of cooking gets done, what kind of water is used for the cooking, because remember, we don't want to cook with lead-tainted water, et cetera. So there's been a lot, that's been from the start. When that health emergency was declared in uh, late September, early October, that was immediate that the schools were shut down shut off, essentially. Uh, child cares are now being, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, bef there's child cares as well as um, uh, private schools and charter schools that are currently in the line to be tested. So they actually prioritize, we prioritize younger than older. Um, and we meaning that I actually meet with DEQ staff and actually leaders along with the mayor's office um, and the city administrator on Fridays where I do get to hear these reports. So what I'm saying to you today is secondhand. Yeah. Um, so I, one thing, so the drinking, the water filters, what, sorry, I can't speak today. The drinking fountains have been shut off, but have other water sources been shut off? So are kids washing their hands with this water? My understanding is that they can use the toilets and they're able to wash their hands and such. Now that gets to be an issue if, the, um, if you have a child care center in that school, they need to make sure, because we don't want the babies or right. anything being exposed. But all of that, that has been addressed, because that was a big concern for some of our schools with the really young ones who may not, you know, have a little bit more of that hand to mouth. I must say that the, uh, if, if I can do this, but the, working with the superintendent at the City of Flint, uh, Mr. Tawas, am I saying that, Tawab? Tawab, has, and they have a, the head of their school nursing program is just, a dream. They've been right on it and and very proactive from the start. We, I, I think, <coughs> it was early after. Uh, final question. Um, I think a lot of people are watching this and feeling kind of helpless and yeah. want to be able to help. 
is there a donation center? Is there something where people can help out with this situation? Perfect question. I'm so glad because it is really true, and I'm getting I'm, I'm receiving a lot of requests. The State Emergency Operations Center, and I, you have your emergency manager coordinator there, so I'm sure Kyle can get you information hooked uh, to them. But we do have not only a, a people identified for donations uh, to receive and coordinate those, but also a person who's coordinating volunteer resources. <coughs> As I said today, we really wanted more boots on the ground today to do this door-to-door -door kind of education and outreach. Uh, unfortunately, the weather got in the way, so. You know, we may hear about that today, but the weather was definitely a mitigating factor, but hopefully tomorrow we'll see lots more people out on the ground and reaching out to people. I know there's still people out there who probably are not aware that their Flint's got a water pump. A lot of the volunteerism is being coordinated through the Red Cross at this oh, okay. point, and then um, some of the department folks that are manning the emergency operations centers are helping to coordinate um, physical donations, whether it's water or filters or, or other pieces. Yeah. I'll, oh, absolutely. I'll talk. Well, thank you. And yes, for anybody who has any questions or wants to get more information about uh, um, how to get things in Flint, uh, water filters, get information even about where the transportation issues are, or if you have an idea like you want to donate something, the 211 number there is able to coordinate those calls as well. And uh, when in doubt, the, the local health department. But if there's something, I know Kyle and I will route you the right way if uh, need be. But, the 211 uh, number is in Flint only. Though. Yes, right. All right, so uh, it's, uh, we'll be adjourning now for one hour for lunch. I did want to say, repeat, that residents in Flint can dial 211 to get water and filters. They are in processing of mapping the lead line so that they can be dealt with. Home Depot is donating almost 13,000 cases of water every day. There is a program to go door to door, not just today, but throughout. Absolutely. And there is a public service announcement being done by the state police. So. There is one. It, uh, if we, just I don't want to open. Uh, go ahead, please. Just along the lines of water, because mm -hmm. I'm understanding that water pallets are coming in, but mm -hmm. the fruits and vegetables Lupe will yell at me. may be what's slower to come and have access to. We plant is a food desert. Yes. So okay. no, thank you. That has been, and that is on uh, kind of the list of things: is how do we <coughs> maximize farmers' market and getting those fruits and vegetables in there with access just so that people have access to them uh, and and so that is something that's definitely on the, the hot spot that's part of the, st the state emergency operations center items as well thank you thank you and thank, thank you for you being for that here. update too i didn't mean to but yep. fine thank yeah. you thank you very much thank you, so much. Thank you. oh you bet thank you